Hey, thanks very much, members, for your attendance. I declare the meeting open to the public. Can I advise members that they are welcome to use Wi-Fi connected mobile devices as long as they are on airplane mode and all devices are muted? Can I inform members that uh, Gemma Dolan, Melissa McHugh, uh, Philip McGuigan and Matthew O'Toole will be joining the meeting on Starleaf? At the minute, we've got Ms McHugh and uh, Ms Dolan, and hopefully the other members can get in uh, uh, when they, they can. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep all members in the spotlight for the first five agenda items? If members are content, then I'll proceed to the agenda as follows. Uh, apologies. We have an apology in for Steve Egan, MLA and, of course, Chairperson of the Committee. And I'm sure he's listening in, so if he is, uh, we would like to wish Steve all the best uh, in his recovery uh, from his mishap. And hopefully it will not be too long before he's back uh, in this chair. Uh, presiding over this uh, committee, and also Jim Oster has notified that he will be late. Uh, any other uh, apologies, Clark? I think uh, Mr. McGuigan is just attempting to join us, and Mr. O'Toole will be with us shortly, so we should okay. be all good. Brilliant. Okay. Uh, can I ask the clerk then, has notice been received from any member who has delegated authority to another member of the committee to vote under the temporary standing order 1156? Nope. Nope. Okay. Declarations of interest. Uh, all members are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests at each committee meeting as applicable. Can I ask have members any relevant interests to declare at this meeting? No? Okay. Welcome, uh, Philip. Uh, okay. Thanks, members. Uh, item number three, then, is Chairperson's Business. Uh, ministerial Statement. Can I say that the Minister provided an oral statement on the British-Irish Council dig Digital Inclusion Ministerial Meeting? Uh, members were, are asked to note the relevant correspondence, which is, which is at page three of tabled items. Can I ask our members content to note? Is this agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, item number four, draft minutes of proceedings of the 3rd of March 2021. Can I say that the draft minutes of the meeting pay, uh, on that date are at page seven? Can I ask our members content that the draft minutes of the 3rd of March are an accurate record of proceedings. Is that agreed? Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, item number five, matters arising. There are no matters arising, members. Are you content to move on? Okay, moving on. Item number six, then, is an oral briefing of Social Enterprise NI, procurement, public procurement common framework. Uh, uh, this oral briefing is designed to inform the committee's scrutiny of the public procurement common framework. Members may also find this briefing informative if the Department brings forward a social value in procurement bill uh, in this mandate. Can I welcome on Starleaf, uh, Colin Jess, Director of Social Enterprise NI, and also John McMullen, Chairperson of Social Enterprise NI. You're very welcome. Colin, we had John. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Colin. I've yet to see John. He was there a minute ago. He just vanished. We'll, we'll give him. We'll give the technology a few seconds to catch up. Hopefully, if that's. Does, does Colin want to lead off? Maybe John will. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen. Just before we ask you to. There he is. There he is. Okay. Just before we ask you to lead off, Colin, uh, can I just say, uh, inform the members that the following papers are relevant to this agenda item. Clark's cover note at page 17, social enterprise briefing paper at page 22, and the departmental update uh, on public procurement common framework and related pages from pages 26 onwards. So without further ado, very, you're very welcome, John. Thank you very much. Uh, and Colin, thank you. So without further ado, Colin, do you want to make a, an opening statement? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, on behalf of Social Enterprise Northern Ireland, um, who are the representative body for the sector, we welcome this opportunity to participate in the committee's consultation in relation to the public procurement common framework. Um, as uh, you say, I'm joined today by my chairman, John McMullen. I will make the opening statement and then we will offer, um, look for questions from, from committee. Over the last 12 months, all our lives have changed. We as a society have recognised the need to work differently and support the health and wellbeing of our local communities. We have seen how our communities can be, come together during these real times of need and deliver critical support services where most needed. 
At the heart of many of these communities are proactive social enterprise businesses of all sizes focused on local, regional, social and economic issues and retaining profits to invest in greater social impact. We believe social enterprises are best placed to support the public sector in the delivery of citizen-facing policy objectives. However, unlike other parts of the UK, social enterprises face significant barriers to accessing public sector contracting opportunities. For example, the public sector tendering is designed to favour larger commercial organisations with the same standard processes applicable to a £10,000 contract as to a £10 million contract. We feel this is clearly disproportionate and makes public sector tendering unviable for many of our members and also the wider Northern Ireland economy. The social enterprise sector in Northern Ireland is growing, plays a significant part in the economy, particularly um, large and vibrant in Northern Ireland as a combined direct, indirect and induced economic local impact worth £625 million. employs 25,000 people with over 50,000 employees from their immediate localities. So this places the sector as an important vehicle for the delivery of the PFG outcomes around disadvantage, deprivation, reducing economic inactivity and delivering greater innovation indicators. While Northern Ireland complies with the same UK statutory obligations in England and Wales, there is not a consistent approach as to the local application of a broad range of procurement regulations in particular, the Social Value Act in England and Wales, introduced in 2012 and its Scottish equivalent, has reshaped procurement process throughout Great Britain, but has inexplicitly uh, absent in Northern Ireland for over 11 years. So some of the key sector uh, procurement issues, just like to mention um, in the opening address, the sector faces significant barriers to accessing public sector contracting opportunities compared to other parts of the UK. As I mentioned, the only region in the UK without a Social Value Act or equivalent. The absence of such a legal statute means that both local commissioners and procurement practitioners have no legal obligations to consider and score social value within public procurement. While there is some procurement policy guidance on the inclusion of social value, there is no statutory duty to compel its inclusion. The absence of a statutory duty means, for example, local government and other public bodies such as universities are excluded from the requirement to comply with the Northern Ireland Public Procurement Policy. This is why the Social Value Act for Northern Ireland is so essential. It's the only part of the UK not to actively promote reserve contracts, while they appear in the UK public contract regulations adopted by Northern Ireland. This means that commissioners may not be aware of or encouraged to use this as a sourcing option. Um, public procurement regulations allow public contracting authorities to deliver social value by reserving the right to participate in procurement procedures to those economic operators whose main aim is the social professional integration of disabled or disadvantaged persons, such as long-term unemployed. There is a lack of consistency in the use of social clauses in Northern Ireland public contracts, local and central government and arm's length bodies. The focus on short-term contracting opportunities do not provide any opportunities for long-term social changes. The sector has the closest economic relationship with local communities than either the public or private sector and therefore is best place to provide more long-term solutions. We understand that local commissioners see procurement regulations as a barrier to developing these more innovative long-term sourcing opportunities. However, other UK jurisdictions would seem to be able to put in place these types of strategies that allow for a more collaborative relationship with social enterprise to address local social issues. It is important that development of a common procurement framework that we actively seek out and promote these more innovative types of long-term sourcing solutions to address key social issues. To, to enable these and other opportunities noted above, we see the need to develop a transformation academy independent of CPD and in partnership with academia to invest in training and development of intelligent public service commissioning and commissioners Building this skill set across our public sector will ensure a greater alignment of public spending to social value. The above proposals are significant change from the current customs and practices within Northern Ireland's central government. The use of public procurement as a tool to tackle social exclusion has developed over time in the United Kingdom. While all the UK jurisdictions share the same set of public contracting regulations, the interpretation, policies and best practices around social value has been ignored here 
and what we believe has been a disadvantage for Northern Ireland. The focus on our local central government public procurement has been on short-term solutions to try to address long-term social issues. In addition, local government has not been provided with any centralised procurement policy direction, resulting in a wide variation in the interpretation of the PCRs. Compared to the rest of the UK, Northern Ireland Commissioners have not been provided with the tools or techniques to implement real and meaningful social changes. It's therefore important that any move towards a UK-wide public procurement common framework rebalances these variants and looks at the wider sourcing opportunities and best practices that will create opportunities for the sector to maximise and deliver long-term social value. The public procurement in Northern Ireland is clearly risk-averse and driven by transactional processes, which I would suggest is preventing real innovative uh, sourcing and delivery of desired policy outcomes. As we now have left the legal constraints of the European Union, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to fundamentally rethink how best to use our taxpayer money to ensure we maximise on these investments and bring about real and meaningful changes to how government delivers its services to local communities and citizens. So finally, these changes are much wider than public procurement and will require key decision makers, budget and policy owners to become more intelligent commissioners of services. This, however, are a fundamental change in culture within the public sector, with commissioners of more commercial focus, along with an understanding of different sourcing options and broader appetite to the management of risks. These changes, along with a more innovative approach to sourcing, should help to ensure a more productive and effective delivery of future government services in partnership with our citizens. Okay, thank you very much. Colin, John, do you want to add to that at this stage? Chairman, thanks for the opportunity, but maybe better to, to allow members to ask us questions. I think uh, the statement's been fairly comprehensive. Okay, thank you very much for your bravery. That's, that's very good of you. Uh, so thank you very much, Colin, John, and thank you for being here today. Can I ask the question then, uh, you, you, you mentioned the, the legislation in GB around the 2012 uh, piece in GB. Can you give any examples of what social clauses should look like? Maybe I can pick that up, Colin. Well, one of the things, Chairman, uh, which was interesting for the for the uh, UK or the GB legislation was it came through as a private members' bill to to, to reshape the approach to, to, to procurement. Now, if you look in our, our context, Matt, I'll give you I'll give you a live live example. We have a wonderful social enterprise right. called Madlug. And Madlock produce they produce bags, and, and the, the premise behind the, these bags that they, they produce for carrying your computer, for carrying your 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 business equipment, in, is that young people in care are moving between house uh, homes uh, 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 and uh, accommodation, carry their goods in plastic bags. So the essence of the of the business proposition with Madlock is that if you buy one of their bags, an equivalent bag goes to a young person who uh, is living in care and is in need of a bag to preserve their self-respect and keep their goods in. So simply, you're connecting up a service that you want or a good that you want to provide for an added value. That's the essence of a, of a social clause. You get better value for the public money that you spend. Okay, thank you. John, and what would, what would you guys like to see <coughs> included in a new departmental uh, bill, you know, Call it what it may be, but it might be a social value in procurement bill. What what sort of clauses would you like to see in that contained within that bill? Chairman, we'd require that the decision making process in relation to the award of a contract for goods or, 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 or services has a scoring matrix which includes three elements. One is the normal price. Second is the normal quality aspect of it and third is to have a section and a score a meaningful score for social value allowing the competition to be not just on price but to be on the quality of the of the offer and the social impact that that uh, uh, that it, it can can be achieved we think that provides much better i think we call it social value for money svfm is rather than fvfm Thank you. Sure, can I maybe just come in yeah, there as well? You talked about the um, 2012 Act of England and Wales. 
Um, in 2017, the Land Procurement Board in Northern Ireland, under the chairmanship of the Finance Minister, um, uh, agreed to proceed with the Social Value Act for Northern Ireland. However, less than a week later was whenever the Assembly and the Executive collapsed. So the cross-party support was there at the time to take this forward. So um, that's nearly, the England Wales Act has been nearly 10 years since it's been in place. Um, Scotland have their own legislation um, around procurement in Wales as well. So we feel that you know, when we're looking at how can Northern Ireland um, work alongside other parts of the UK, we think obviously it's, it's one, of the, one of the main things that we need to bring ourselves up to speed with. Okay, thank you. Just before bringing more uh, further members in, can I ask one final question at this stage? Uh, we hear all the time from our public bodies and our local government uh, organisations that th their hands are tied with regards to procurement in many ways. They have so many stipulations and so many legal uh, requirements uh, that usually the choice isn't really a choice. They, they have to go through a process and that outcome of the process is who they need to select uh, for procurement, uh, whether that be goods or service. Uh, how do you see that changing? Uh, now that we've left the EU, and you did mention legal constraints of the EU, but it's probably much more than that. It's probably a mindset. It's probably a culture there. How do, how do we go about changing that other than a bill? Okay. So one of the things that we would we'd be very keen to see uh, introduced in Northern Ireland would be uh, an academy, a transformation academy, where you know once it's we talk about procurement, but it's more than procurement. It's about sourcing. It's about commissioning. It's about looking at the start as to what outcome do we want to deliver here? Because by the time it gets to procurement stage, uh, it's been set in stone. And it's all too late. So we, we we would like to see those that are involved in actually drawing up the process. Um, trained under a transformation academy. It's happening across um, the UK, and we have been working with one of the local academia here to, to train commissioners um, that are more focused on uh, outcomes and how can we get the best outcomes. So, um, you know, yes, you, you can say that um, it's quite restricted yep. to the process that we currently operate under. And if we can work back and actually start the process from scratch again. I think that's that's one of the things we would have. John might have an overview on that too. Well, I'd like to add to the important point that Colin's making. Chair, he makes the point that we don't invest in training our commissioners to determine the best way to source a good or a service. And there's even within the European Current Europe, uh, previous European legislation, which we, we, we're we still, uh, to some degree, ad adhere to, a huge range of flexibilities that no one talks about. There's very little advice on. For instance, you don't have to procure. You can grant aid uh, a service. You can reserve contracts. You can use a light touch regime. Regime. You can offer concession contracts. You can actually procure through innovation partnerships. You can open a competitive dialogue. You can have call down frameworks, and you can have single action tenders. But our commissioners aren't sufficiently trained or invested in to determine the range of, of models that they can use. And that's a problem for us because it simply appears to be let's compete on price and then we're safe on price and we award on price. And then you lose the added value that you would want to get out of making sure public money does the best social value or provides the best social value it possibly can. Okay, thank you. I'm going to bring in uh, Melissa, please, then. Can we put him through the system? Starleaf system. Thank you. Okay, Chair, yeah. No, I'm good, Chair. I'll be as fine to rule with Colin and with John. You're both very welcome, uh, John and Colin. Uh, just there's two issues just that I'd like to maybe touch on. One of them in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, social costs and the likes of it. Uh, what role would you see for trade unions or trade union membership uh, in that respect? And uh, the second thing that I'm really interested in as well, too, is uh, that uh, when you have uh, <clears throat> talked there about the Transformation Academy and, uh, and how it would make its recommendations and again, too, uh, in particular in relation to trade union. Colin, do you want to take up the transitional, the transitional academy, and I'll, I'll I'll get deeper into the issue about the trade union. Yeah. So, Alicia, thanks for the question. The transformation academy. Um, 
I suppose where we're talking about transformation academy, I, I would consider the trade union as sort of nearly the deliverers and the hands-on people here. What we're talking about here is actually changing the whole mindset before getting to that point. So we're looking at those that are actually designing the, the process, sourcing, commercial, commissioning, before it gets to procurement. So once it gets to the procurement stage, commissioners will have done their work bubble because they're, they'll have been trained, they'll have been, um, will be at a stage that by the time it gets to the, on the ground, um, there'll be a new, new, new process in place. Um, and I suppose not, not wanting to touch on what John's going to say, but so is around um, the trade union's involvement would be around, you know, they're, they're very keen to um, look at, make sure that people are being paid the living wage, you know, that sort of thing. So, John, you have more comments on that? Yeah, yeah, just to add that, Malicia, the, 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 this is a process that should appeal to public servants as well as much as it does to, to, to trade unionists. Uh, well, what it would mean, the, the, the organisations who can deliver in this are can, can be cooperative, mutualised community uh, businesses. Uh, they meet you about terms and conditions. They can be specified in the contract. And if that's what you require, Colin made the point about the, the living wage. If you require that to be delivered, and I think it's a good thing to suggest it require to be delivered, it's priced yeah. in. Everybody prices it in. So it actually controls and supports the uh, good jobs provision that I think would be a, a, a very central to a trade union focus. But it's probably a central to all our focuses, whether that's a political perspective or it's a social perspective, Lisa. Yes, thank you. And just in the case of actually pricing it in on that, then uh, it becomes maybe again to relevant to our three elements: price, quality, and social value. And yeah. whether or not they're whether or not they're weighted, whether or not they're weighted, because one yeah. could weigh the other depending on we'll say the. Well, that, that, that's insightful. There's, there's very not many experiences of of, of uh, social value being scored, but it tends to be around the two percent. Okay. Yeah. Our view would be a third, a third, a third. I'd agree with you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Uh Can we bring Philip onto the spotlight, please? Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, Gentlemen, I mean, in terms of the procurement practices, you know, in terms of scoring uh, or procurement practices having social value, I mean, can you give me a few examples just of the type of practices uh, that, you know, would score, score highly as having social value? And then also, uh, I mean, you, you have talked about uh, social value in other jurisdictions. I mean, can I ask just for clarification what the situation is in the south obviously on on, on this island it would make sense that the, you know, the procurement practices are mm -hmm. some the number of uh people who would be tender north and south uh so that and then just i mean some of the things that have worked well in uh other jurisdictions and the benefits that have flowed from that if i could maybe pick up the situation in our i felt at that stage um uh, funny, I was on a, a call yesterday, and the sector in RI looks very envious as to where we are in the north, and we're you know we look envious to what's happened across in other jurisdictions. I think um, the one thing that they do have in RI which we don't have in Northern Ireland, and one which we're going to be pressing for now in the next um, next few months and year, is an actual strategy for social enterprise sector in Northern Ireland, of which social value will form part of. Um, you know, what, what we need to really is put social enterprise at the heart of the Northern Ireland economy. So a strategy in place that's signed off by all departments and all political parties is essential. And that's going to be one of our main focuses going forward. So it's not, um, whilst they have a strategy in RI, um, they, they admit them, themselves are playing catch up. And the idea of social value was on the, was on the agenda, I think, going back in 2014. And then there was a change in government and it was part so, um, and it hasn't really been taken forward to any great extent since that. So, um, that's the situation in RI. Um, as far as the scoring is concerned, you know, there are certain suggestions, but you can build, you can build scoring in to, um, you know, things like uh, employment training and skills and how you can bring those furthest from the labour market into employment, how you can upskill them, how you can train them, um, building resilient supply chains, um, just given equal opportunity and employment practices uh, are all means that you can bring into a scoring matrix. But I think I think the benefits 
the benefits of where social enterprise can bring um, through procurement. Um, one of our members in East Antrim, for example, there was a Queen's University uh, worked with them on a, a just actually trying to assess how much money they contribute to their local local area, if you like, and by employing those with learning disabilities um, um, and other, other disadvantaged individuals, they saved the public purse, if you like, 350,000, I think it was a year, because if they didn't bring, if they didn't employ those individuals, those individuals would be a cost to the Department of Health, the Department of Education. So not only are they employing them, but they're actually, those individuals are paying their, their rate, their tax as well on employment. So, you know, they got some to bear in mind as well. Maybe a direct answer to your question, Philip, is there's little experience of scoring social value in procurements in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, the point that Colin, Colin w was making, that the, one of the things that, that w it seemed to be, maybe it was a way of not having to address the whole broader issue of social, of social value was to create employment opportunities with contracts. So per million pound of spent, you had to put a trainee in. That's a useful, not a bad thing. It's very blunt. Uh, it, it isn't necessarily directed where un unemployment is at its highest. But if you do something like, if you go into the, uh, uh, in, in the Porter Down area, you, you, you go to uh, uh, Craig Avon, the, le the, the leisure centre, and you go for a, a, a nice, when we were able to, a nice lunch. If you do that in a number of the leisure centres in Belfast, if you do that in the Ulster American Folk Park, if you do that in the Ulster Museum, you're being served by social enterprises who are not only providing excellent food, but they're also creating mixed mixed uh, uh, employment for people with disability and, uh, and and more able body people. And the the outcome is is the one that that, that, that Colin Colin was saying that AEL and Lauren have indicated that uh, you, the savings for each person who's been uh, receipt in receipt of only disability benefits is around uh, for them is around three hundred and sixty five thousand pounds saved in addition and benefits per year because the end of those 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 individuals have become productive by permanent employment they actually gain a huge amount their families gain a hu huge amount and there's a reduction to cost this is a, this is a very win-win-win that when we open our eyes to social value is more than just a few training places I think the point you make there, John, as well, just to back that up, is um, it's not that social enterprises deliver quality. You know, there's no, we're, we're not saying, you know, there's no, but there's nobody under any illusion that social enterprises deliver on quality because they're businesses, they operate as businesses, they generate income so they can share their social mission. So, you know, nobody's going to buy off anybody who's not creating, they're not producing good food or good products. So, you know, we just be under no illusion that this is a we operate our members operate providing goods of the highest quality okay thank you very much colin and john okay thank you philip i'll bring in pat now who's in the building oh thanks very much uh, thanks chair and thanks colin and john as well i suppose i have a daughter with learning difficulties and she, she works out with a little open hands child nursery so i know right. the benefit but we also have some great suppliers and uh, some great social enterprises in Lisburn and Castlereagh. Um, I'm, I'm looking down on uh, the question. Uh, with the new post-EU exit frameworks adopted, uh, social enterprises would like to see new legislative powers devolved to Northern Ireland in respect to public procurement. Um, can you give me a, where you think those, what they should be and where they probably sit with the powers for the special enterprise area, like the executive and the assembly to game. Okay, but by the way, begin with that, Pat. Pat, uh, uh, procurement is a reserve matter, so it's, it's in our gift in Northern Ireland to make and design this system which best suits our needs. And I think that would be the argument we, we, we would put forward, is that we need a system which has flexibility, which enables uh, innovation that doesn't doesn't retard it, but it's focused on if we spend a public pound, we want more than a service for that. We want to see uh, social value as a result of that and allow the competition to develop in, in and around social value 
uh, because it's got an equal scoring uh, uh, level of, as price would have or quality would have. What we found watching in, in, in GB, where the Social Value Act has been in place longer, is that where, where, where a major contract is, let's say a, a building contract, those contractors build into their supply chain, supply chains, social enterprises that are local to where they're working. This is a significant, easy win for us in terms of squeezing better social value for money out of our procurement. And Pat, you're you're um, you're quite right. Let's burn a castle, Ray. You know, you've got some very strong uh, social enterprises doing amazing work. You know, I can think of three or four off the top of my head, and there's more. So, um, you know, you're obviously you're obviously blessed, and you're part of the world with. Well, if, you, if you go for a cup of coffee up on stepping stones, for example, and you're you can be served by people in there who have learning disabilities, but um, you know, and you've got the Mary Maran actually, the employers for childcare, was nominated or named this sheet this week in the top 100 um, women on International Women's Day of social entrepreneurs in Europe. So the strength strength of our members, especially in your in your uh, part of the world, is, is very very strong. So Colin, um, and through the chair as well. Uh, there was a mayor, uh, William Leatham, was mayor, and that was his charity. And I remember there was set when I was a councillor there for that, but uh, for his help for uh, stepping stones and the amount of work yeah. we do. And there, there are, there, of course, there are others, but um, I, I remember it's, 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 it's with all of this and with the procurement and with buying. But is there any way, I mean, I've always tried to find, is there a way that the general public like, would be able to find or, or know or the, 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 where the procurement or how it was reached out? Like, I'm thinking of the scores on the doors for restaurants, because sometimes when we go into little stepping stones, it's nice to wait that extra moment, because you know that you're being served with someone who maybe just it's, it's, are doing everything they possibly can and flat out, but just it would be a nice way of showing if there was a way that your enterprise could maybe do like scores on the doors with it as well. I know it's a wee bit off piece to it, but I think. No, but it's, it's, a, it's a fair point, Pat, and um, I think you also agree that it's, uh, some of the food and stepping stones is, is definitely worth waiting for. Um, we, we as a representative body, um, whenever someone joins us, the first day, you know, they, they, they will be able to use our logo as um, almost like an accreditation piece, but we, um, we're, we're looking at how we take it to the next level. We've now got the contract for the next three years to manage this program. Um, we're successful in that process. And one of the things we're doing is an accreditation piece and how can, we act, how can the public see like a yeah. stars you're talking about or whatever, or scoring system. But I think it's just the fact that we just want people to know they're a social enterprise. And it goes back to the point, I know we digress a wee bit, but we we don't want people to deal with social, or to buy from social enterprises because social enterprises are doing great work. Social enterprises are businesses. They operate and they sell in every other business. It's always the other way around. So you, you, will, you will buy from a social enterprise because their product delivers on time, because it's quality. And then at the end of the day, you think, oh, so that's what so that's what, what your profits are used for. So it's sort of reversing. It's nearly enterprise social, as the way it should probably be. Yes, Colin, but they also change the areas that they're set up in and the buy-in from the general public that feed ownership off them and the work that's been done with them. So it's it's like throwing a stone into a pedal. That good work and that good feeling spreads right throughout that whole community. And I can name off more than one. I have plenty of them because I like to go and visit them and see them and see them doing as well as they all are. Well, can I throw a name at you in this part of Castle Ray and Yeah. Um, the, the work that they have done on the old, the old Warren Estate. Do you know, uh, sorry, we're, um, we're just, that, that, that's who I was thinking of there, just the amount of work that they, that, that they did and the, 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 I know that their AGM is coming up and we're going, I, I intend to go along and, and to visit that one, but we need to roll out those successes and people need to see what they are doing for the community as well. I mean, I know exactly what that group has done for the community, all right, and I'm very, I'm well pleased to put that in public record and put my thanks out to them. There is a whole awareness piece, Pat, and that's, that's part of it, you know. Yeah. Okay, Pat, thanks very much. Uh, can I ask questions that there's no one else coming in just at the present time, but can I ask just before you go, we all have a different idea of what society should look like, I suppose, and that's a very 
a, a big question. So it strikes me that there are many different social values. Mm -hmm. So how do you guys grapple with ranking, first of all, measuring social value and then ranking it? Yeah. Go, sure, Chairman, going back to the point that Colin made, it's in the hands of the commissioner to determine what they see as being the added value they're looking for a service, which can be anything from, well, let me give you an example. Uh, my background history was with an organization called Bryson, and when we pitched uh, for recycling. We took a view that recycling wasn't collecting waste. It was creating material that goes back into into uh, reuse. It's a circular economy uh, m m model that wasn't understood by any of the commissioners. It was never it was never uh, provided an advantage in the competition. The competition was was primarily primarily price. So it's about the commissioner sitting down and realizing what added value they can get. So they want a, a contractor who will provide employment. They wanted to provide employment uh, from uh, uh, sourcing some people or a number of people who are long term unemployed or people who have been living with disability and uh, they want sustainable jobs. They want those jobs to be to be uh, well, well remunerated, a range of things that the, that the commissioner sits down and identifies. And I would also suggest opening uh, a, a, like a black box for added value that, that those are competing it might provide or determine where they're going to source their food from a social enterprise and, and whatever they're pitching for. So a range of things can come in, then they're easily they're easily measured and you give a score for that. And I think that's how you, if it's, it's I think someone mentioned scores on doors earlier and it scores wins pri prizes. If you can win a contract on the basis of being more, having greater social impact, it doesn't take long for the uh, uh, for the uh, economy and businesses to catch on. That's a value, and they and they re reshape, they build mixed supply chains, they build consortiums to to, to deliver services. So it, it sounds complex, but it's really not that complicated. And there's a lot of work being done on frameworks for measuring that. So I mean that that, uh, that, that can be used either academia has produced them, the cabinet office has produced them. There's one one called TOMS, which is which is often used. So there's lots of ways already in play that have, ta uh, have been tested in capturing and scoring this added value. Well, if I could just nip in there, Chair, before um, uh, just to say that we're not asking asking uh, to spend more. We're just asking to spend different and create spend smart. Spend smarter. Yeah. Okay, listen, John and Colm, thank you very much for your time. It's been very very informative. Uh, it's been a very uh, enjoyable session, so thank you uh, for making us all aware and for taking up your time uh, to no be problem. with us here today. So sure, can I add one, sure, can I add one very last but, but brief point? Of Were course. You considering this, one of the big issues in procurement that drives it is the, concern, the, the, the uh, uh, concerns around challenges to, to awards. I think you need to look at that, find a way to uh, speed up and maybe minimize uh, the uh, exposure for uh, uh, challenges. Because challenges come for many reasons. Some of them are just fixatious. Some of them are simply to, to get uh, a sight of the winning bid so that you, you're gathering intelligence. So we need to find a way to make the uh, uh, challenge process easier to manage uh, and, and quick, quicker, to, quick, quicker to go through. I think we'll all agree with that. Uh, John, thank you very much for your time. OK, thanks very much now. Thanks, Bye -bye. Uh, could I ask Assembly Broadcasting to uh, remove the witnesses from the spotlight, please? Uh, can I ask then, are there any actions which members wish to take forward at this stage? Any comments? Can I ask members to set out any views they would have in respect to public procurement common framework at this stage? Anyone want to come in with thoughts? Oh. Chair, I mean, we've heard of the, the social value and the value there is to to local communities. We're, we're, we have a procurement board uh, in place there at the moment. I mean, is, is it not to ask them? Could we ask them and would we get their opinion on that and then we can progress from that? Okay. And they're coming on the 24th. Yep, 24th. They're coming up. So, so um, hold, your, hold your wished. That's right, we'll get that on the agenda then. Yeah. We'll let them know we'll be asking them that. Okay, yep. okay. Any other comments from members at this stage? Okay, so we'll await then the presentation from CPD. 
Will we advance? Uh, Members, I, I just want to share to you that I, I mean, I, I've said about my daughter, she's 32 now and she's learning difficulties and she works with help on hands there in Lisbon, but it has transformed her life and she's earning her own money and delighted in order to be able to go and do it now, as best of her ability and she takes it on and she's all of the anxieties that everyone else would have in order to do a job. But as Colin and John said earlier, it is win-win. It's win at home, it's win in house, it's win with the brothers and sisters, and it's win with the parents and the community. So there is real worth in it. So uh, I said earlier where I tried to see if I, if I could get the council to do like scores in the doors, because I know the general public would spend you know, that little bit extra and go out of their way to find those places, and to find that all of our community is welcome and being helped. Okay. Can I ask, Clark, have you enough on that, or do you want to wait to CBT? No, I, I'm good, actually. I can draft something, okay. Chairperson, if I were of committee response, and then when you've heard from the Northern Ireland Procurement Board, members can change their minds and okay. feel free to do so. Okay. Okay. okay so just a, in, in regards to that, I, uh, is the committee content to instruct the clerk to draft a response to the department indicating the committee's view on the public procurement common framework, uh, which would be considered then at the next committee meeting? Uh, the caveat to with regard to CBD coming up on the 24th. Are members agreed? Agreed. Okay. Uh, moving on then uh, to item number seven, uh, the oral. Uh, can I ask? Sorry, first of all, can I ask the Assembly Broadcasting Team to add the officials to the spotlight, please? Thank you, Joanne and Jeff. Uh, you're very welcome, as always. Uh, you have a new face. You have a new face to contend with today. <laughs> Uh, but uh, can I just uh, then say item number seven is the oral evidence Department of Finance feedback from the 2021 to 22 draft budget public consultation. Can I welcome on Starleaf Joanne McBurney, Acting Budget Director, and Jeff McGuinness, Head of uh, Central uh, Expenditure Division. Can I just say that this evidence session is being reported by Hansard and the following papers are relevant to this agenda item. Clerk's note at page 58. The departmental correspondence from the Chancellor's, oh, sorry, on the Chancellor's budget statement at page 65. Correspondence from the Scottish Parliament Finance and Constitution Committee relating to budget scrutiny at page 70. Relevant raised paper at page 72, and in the draft budget consultation document itself at page 109. Uh, so, without further ado, can I ask you, Joanne, to make an opening statement, please? Yes, certainly, Chair. So, start um, as usual by thanking you for the invitation to attend today. Um, I believe from communication from the clerk that you wish to cover three areas um, the budget consultation process, the Chancellor's recent UK budget, and the 400 million New Deal for Northern Ireland fund. So, I'm going to try and provide a brief overview of these in the opening remarks, and then, as usual, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Turning first to budget consultation, um, as the committee will be aware that due to the delay in the UK spending review, the draft budget was not agreed until 17th of January this year. The announcement of the draft budget initiated a five and a half week period of consultation that concluded on the 25th of February. While this period was much shorter than we would have liked, it did provide some space for members of the public and representative groups to engage with the budget process. In effect, there were two consultation processes occurring simultaneously. The first was the general consultation process on the budget, where the public or representative groups would provide opinions on where funding should go and how revenue should be raised. This process was run by DOF. The executive will receive a summary of the consultation responses for, from this general process to help inform them as they make final decisions on the budget. The second consultation process is a more specific quality process. This involved each department screening its draft budget to determine the potential for quality impact and producing an EQIA if necessary, and then consulting on that EQIA. This EQIA consultation was run by the relevant department. At the conclusion of this consultation period, each screening or EQIA document will be published by the relevant department and presented to the executive to help inform them as they make final decisions on the budget. I'm going to focus my remarks today on the general consultation process, which was run by DOF. The general consultation process was broadly aligned along three strands stakeholder engagement, anonymous online survey responses, and bespoke responses from individuals and representative groups. 
Uh, looking at the stakeholder engagement, a total of 22 stakeholder groups were invited to individual meetings and 15 took up that invitation. These meetings consisted of a presentation on the draft budget and question and answer sessions. The anonymous online survey as part of the budget documentation of online survey was set out seeking the answers to six key questions that would help guide those who may not know how to respond to the budget process in a meaningful way. While this method was anonymous, the metrics behind the survey allowed us to log IP addresses to avoid multiple responses from the same person. The six questions were, what service would you prioritize? Are there services we should stop or reduce? Are there services we should charge for? How can we reduce demand for public services? How do we balance public sector pay against other priorities? And have you any other views for discussion? There were 70 responses to the survey. Uh, in terms of bespoke responses, an email address was set up to allow those that wished to provide more detailed information by web response. A total of 98 responses were received via this channel. And as you might expect, most of these responses were from organizations or umbrella groups. I want to say a little bit about the consultation analysis. All of the responses are read by my team, and for each response, key issues are expected. Where multiple responses are similar in nature, this is noted as a potential coordinated response. Key issues from all the responses are then combined, and the top emerging themes are noted. The executive are then provided with a hierarchy of top themes and other general themes, departmental specific issues, and any other issues raised. This allows them to see all significant issues raised with the top teams indicating those areas which were most frequently raised. This analysis is yet to be provided to the executive as part of its considerations in the final budget. However, it will be no surprise to the city to hear some of the, the emerging themes, and these have been multi-year budgeting, welfare reform mitigations and the independent advice centres funding, programme for government alignment, new decade new approach funding, health and social care, transformation and COVID-19. In terms of outcome, there's still some analysis to be done on responses that were received after the deadline but the material will be provided to the executive in advance of decisions being made in the budget. And it will be for the executive to make decisions informed by the outcome of the general consultation and the equality considerations. Turning now to the UK budget 2021, the committee will have seen the Department of Finance note on the Chancellor's budget. However, I'll run through some of the key elements. As the committee will be aware, there's still much needed support packages for COVID-19. As a result, the Chancellor announced an extension to the furlough scheme and the self-employed support scheme to the end of September. These are UK wide. The furlough scheme conditions will remain the same for employees, with businesses providing a contribution of 10% in July and 20% in August and September. The self-employed support scheme will provide a fourth grant covering February, April and a fifth grant to cover the period from May onwards. It will be available to new businesses who have filed a 1920 tax return. Universal credit up list will continue for a further six months. And there will also be an equivalent, equivalent working tax credit support over the same period. The Chancellor also announced further rates relief for England, and the Minister has instated his intention to implement further rates reliefs here in due course. The budget also confirmed the corporation tax exemption for the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. This is expected to save the executive between 10 and 20 million per annum. As a result of the Chancellor's Budget's announcement of further funding for England, the Executive will receive Barnet consequences of 411.9 million resource Dale. There has been no change to Capital Dale. The resource consequentials have arisen mainly as a result of COVID-19 support that amounted to 407.7 million, and a table of the consequentials was provided to the committee. In terms of Whitehall-led schemes, the Chancellor announced the levelling up fund. This will apply in Northern Ireland, although it's not clear how it will be implemented in practice. The Chancellor also announced allocations from the 400 million New Deal for Northern Ireland fund, which will be run by the NIO. Best and I will receive 8 million over two years for business support, and Park for Economy will receive a further 15 million over three years for skills. The Chancellor also announced the UK Infrastructure Bank with 12 billion of equity and debt capital to finance local authority and provide private sector infrastructure projects across the UK. While all of these will apply in Northern Ireland, there's no direct influence for the Assembly or the Executive in the determination of allocations. Turning specifically to the New Deal for Northern Ireland, um, as set out in the letter to the committee, this funding is not under the remit of the Executive. However, um, what we're aware of is the Westminster government announced 400 million of funding as a new deal for Northern Ireland. As part of the protocol, the Westminster government committed to implement this new deal to help boost economic growth, increase competitiveness, and invest in infrastructure. 
The 400 million New Deal funding package is to be administered by the NIO and is expected to cover both reserved and devolved matters. As it's being administered by the NIO, it's for them to determine the funding profile allocations and the capital resource split. To coincide with the Chancellor's budget, the NIO has written to DFE to confirm allocations of 8 million for Invest NI and 15 million over three years for investment in skills. These allocations were not known of by DOF prior to the letters of confirmation being issued by NIO. And it is a matter of some concern that this funding, along with the Leveling Up Fund and the Shared Prosperity Fund, are now encroaching on what is the devolved space. Finally, Chair, we hope today will be helpful to the committee as it scrutinises the 21-22 budget, which will come before this committee at the estimate stage in June. Um, we, as officials, are ready to assist the committee in any way over the next four months in that scrutiny process. And we would hope that you would invite us back once the executive has announced its final budget in March later on this month. Happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, Joanne, thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, presentation. Thank you. Can I uh, start on with the NIO piece, uh, the 400 million? Uh, and you did show concern there with regards, illustrate concern about the fact that NIO then administer this, uh, and they have already started uh, formulating bids to, if I'm right. From right, uh, if I hear, heard you right, they have started to allocate bids to to organisations within devolved departments. So how how do those two marry up with regards to the the budget going forward, and then this injection of money that's that's NIO money, for want of a better word? How does that actually work um, throughout the year? Right. Well. Firstly, Chair, I, th I think that's a very good point, and um, NIO haven't actually shared an awful lot of detail with us on how they, they see that working. I mean, obviously, the money will be on top of the funding that the executive allocates through its own budget process, but NIO have been distinctly lacking on the detail of how they, they see this working, other than, as I say, uh, writing to DFE to confirm the funding for Invest NI and for Skills. So we still have to work through that process with NIO. So, so. Uh, if you're a minister and an executive and you decide that a priority for your department is skills, for instance, but it could be anything, uh, and you're lobbying the finance minister and presenting your case to the executive as a whole, uh, and you're requiring so many million, uh, do you as that minister then divert your attention and your energies to the NIO in order to gain that money, that funding? Uh, and how is that scrutinised? How is that accounted for? And who actually attests all that? Chair, those are all very pertinent questions, and they are questions that we would also like the answer to from the, from the Northern Ireland office. To be honest. Yeah. So, so if if you're a minister and you you decide on a priority and you cost it as forty million, and you go to the finance minister asking for forty million. And the finance minister, it's not like him, but the finance minister grants you that 40 million. And then all of a sudden you get an IO money of 40 million. You know, obviously then you have double money, but that's been accounted for, for you know, in a very select way. You can see how it could undermine the whole financial transaction piece and even could, could contaminate monitoring rounds in the future once. So that's that's the space we're in then, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can't disagree with anything you've said. We we have grave concerns about the way this is being handled, and and um, it is the UK government stepping very very firmly into the devolved space. So uh, I, I have to agree with with all your comments there, Chair. And have they done that with Scotland also? Uh, the the new deal for Northern Ireland is unique to us, but in, in regards to their uh, approach to the the Leveling Up Fund and the Shared Prosperity Fund, then yes. They are stepping into the devolved space in, in Scotland and Wales as well. Okay, uh, moving on then. One of the questions I've had for many months is is uh, returning money to the exchequer. Uh, can you give any sort of indication about what the money, what money we're talking about, that could still be at risk and in danger of going back uh, after the thirty first of March? Right. Um, it is our hope and expectation that there will be no money lost to the Exchequer this year. Um, the Finance Minister will be bringing further proposals to the Executive um, shortly. 
um, on the allocation of the, the final amounts available this year, you will know that after the 25th of February, we were left with something 111 million of resource to to allocate. But as I say, the finance minister will bring proposals for the allocation of that funding. And we, would, we fully anticipate that um, any underspends at the end of this year should be within the limits that we're able to carry forward under the budget exchange scheme. Uh, so with regards then to, uh, and you're, you're quite confident there, Joanne, uh, in that, and again, we have all had fears about having to return money, especially in this year of crisis. Uh, and and I under, you know it's it's bound to have been a very arduous task to ensure that all the spending is done, and given the the challenges this year. Uh, but what trick do you have up your sleeve with regards to making sure that money is all spent? Because I I suspect, even in the best well in the world, with the Department of Finance asking other ministers to bring forward bids, some of those bids may not be able to be fulfilled. So is there, is there a trick up your sleeve whereby you can offer some sort of credit in this financial year that will help and assist business next year or shortly after March? Is, is that the ballpark we're talking about? Is that where we're at? There, there, there is, Chair. First of all, yes, I, I am confident about allocate, allocating the money. Um, obviously, underspends will depend on also on the information we're getting from departments and not being accurate. So, so just to have that caveat there, but executive working as a whole and everybody being aware of the risk, hopefully we'll get the information from departments to be able to manage that. There's not so much a trick up our sleeve and I don't want to preempt um, the executive discussion in the paper our, our minister will bring forward, but I think it's no surprise to say that the minister will be looking at further grant schemes that could be delivered by the Department of Finance. And then we have a number of other options on the table for allocating money this year. So I, I think it would be better to talk about that once the executive have a chance to consider that after hopefully within the next week or so when there, there's announcements on the further funding. But yes, we are, we are confident on allocating all the funding and I would hope that departments will work with us in ensuring that they identify any further underspends at a very early stage to allow us to manage those effectively. Okay, thank you. C can you explain the allocations associated with the Chancellor's budget uh, statement, which includes two hundred million for business rates and then the one hundred and thirty eight million for business grants. Uh, and can you explain how then that fits in with the three hundred million of COVID carryover money? And then how will that interfere with any plans that you would have for business support with the money we've still got remaining this year? Okay, um, so the money that we've, if I, if I start sort of with the last point there, the money that we have remaining this year has to be spent in this year, so we will go ahead with those plans for allocating that money. You may recall that when we got additional Barnet for this year for COVID support in January, the um, Treasury did agree that we could carry that forward into next year, so we are planning to carry that, that money forward to next year. That's 238 million. Jeff can jump in if I'm getting my figures wrong, but it's about 238 million we will carry forward to next year. We won't be able to include that in the final budget because it is carry forward money, but we will look to allocate that very early in the new financial year. In terms of the new funding that has come out in the Chancellor's budget in March, that again is money for next financial year. Um, the only way we could allocate that in the, the final budget is if we get a letter from the Secretary of State saying that that money can be allocated and that would need to come in within the next less than a week because we have to have that letter and make a statement to the Assembly 14 days before we lay the, the, the final budget. But regardless of that, that money will be available next year. And, and relation to it coming from uh, consequentials from rates relief in England and from business grants. Of course, it's coming across as a Barnett consequential, which means it is completely unhypothecated and doesn't need to be spent for the same purposes here as the uh, issues which gave rise to it in, in England. So it's for the executive to decide how that money will, will be spent. So the executive will look at the overall pot of funding and decide how best to allocate that. That's not to say that we might not want to do similar things. It's just that that's at the executive's discretion. Okay, I'll leave it there and bring members in. Uh, Jim Wells, first on my list. Yeah, um, John, can I just uh, again tie you down on the four hundred and eleven million Dale resource? Um, was this anticipated in the budget? In other words, did you have a crystal ball which indicated that the normally what would happen in the budget there would be access money, three percent roughly had come to us. So was that preempted in the budget, or is that a genuine windfall? 
It, it's new money. We, we didn't preempt it. We wouldn't have any idea of the quantum. I think it would be fair to say that we were expecting that given the COVID situation, that there would be more funding allocated to COVID in England and we would get more consequentials, but we had no um, pre-warning of the amounts or of the uh, announcements that were given rise to that warning. So no way, it has come as additional money. As I say, it, unless we're informed about it in writing from the Secretary of State, we can't actually build it into the executive's final budget, but then it can be allocated very quickly in the new financial year. I'm disappointed because I was going to ask you for Sunday night's lottery numbers, but obviously you don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> you could put I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you would, actually, because you love your job, John. You love your job. Of course. And we like having you every week uh, before us. <laughs> um, you said that £407 million of that deal had been hypothecated to co coronavirus. But, of course, you, you've no idea at the moment how much of that 407 million will be swallowed up in coronavirus measures so does that give us some latitude if say only half of it's used that we can divert it to other needy projects like general health spending education etc yes but because it has came across as a barn of consequential it's not actually hypothecated so although it has came across as covid support if it wasn't needed for covid support then the executive could take the decision to spend it on something else of course, given where we are with COVID, the chances are it will be needed for COVID support, but it's at the executive's discretion. Yes, but things are moving fast in COVID. The vaccination has yeah. been an astonishingly successful uh, by, by Patricia Down and her team. Infection rates are collapsing, thankfully, uh, at a rate that surely there's bound to be a significant amount of that that can be freed up for other very worthy causes within your overall budget. Yeah, and that is absolutely true. Of course, once we get over the sort of the response to COVID and the need for the support, we need to turn our minds to the economic recovery and how we can support that. But yes, it, it is completely at the executive's discretion how it chooses to spend the funding that has been provided to it through Barnard. So there'll be no clawback whatsoever if it isn't all spent in COVID? No. Right. And then we're just not, bit, not unless Treasury tell me something I'm yeah. not aware of, but well, just that's not our understanding. The, sm the small amount of four million, what has it been allocated for? The difference between the COVID and the actual allocation, where have you allocated the four million to? Right. We haven't actually allocated the four million at all. Uh, Jeff may have the details of what gave rise to that, far and consequential, I don't. But in some ways, that's largely irrelevant because the executive can again spend that where they choose to spend it. Right. Okay. And. Have the executive given any thought as to what's going to happen with the 411 million, or is it just at an initial stage? It's just at an initial stage. Obviously, it was only uh, got there last night, and um, it's something our minister will be considering, and it, he'll bring um, recommendations to the executive in due course. It, it's complicated by the fact that although we know the money will be there for next year, we can't include it in our final budget unless we get that letter from the Secretary of State, and then we lay a, a statement 14 days before we bring the budget document to the Assembly. So. We know it's there and it'll be being considered by the executive how best to spend that. And apart from that one pot of money, I'm sure, like myself, you were listening to the budget uh, very closely. Did you spot any other little uh, pots of gold coming our way as a result of the budget? I'm going to look at Jeff, who's more over the detail of the budget than I am. No, I didn't spot any more pots of gold coming our way. Um, I do think a lot will depend on the um, the response to COVID and economic recovery in England. Jeff, I don't know if you have anything, any more insight than I have there. Um, no, only just to, to mention the, the corporation tax exemption for the housing executive, which is, is a very good win for, for us and for the executive. And do we yes, know, do you know how much that's going to save, presumably the Department of Communities, that uh, change in, in the status of the housing executive? 20 million. It's approximately yeah. 10 to 20 million pounds per annum. Uh, and as Jeff says, that, that is a big win for us, and it's something our minister has been campaigning for for quite a while. Right, OK. Thank so you very, very much. very, very welcome. OK, can I ask the uh, broadcasting team to bring in Philip McGuigan into the spotlight, please? OK, Philip. Thank you, thank you very much, Chair. I mean, I just want to start off by agreeing by the point that, that you made in terms of uh, the North being allocated money, but under the auspices of spending by the, the NIO, I mean, I, I find that totally uh, unsatisfactory uh, in relation to devolved matters, and, and can't the life of me figure out why that would be the case. And and, and I think that you know, if the minister is uh, objecting to that, then this committee should be supporting them uh, in relation to that. 
I mean, it's not lost whenever Joan was outlining that, that, that we're talking about a flatline budget here where our public services, uh, some of which are in crisis and need much needed investment and, and, and Boris Johnson is announcing uh, some kind of speculative tunnel or bridge whenever, you know, we need money for investment in public services and economic recovery here. So, I mean, those are two points. Uh, political points that, that I think need to be made in relation to this budget. Just in relation to some of the other questions, Joanne, some, Jim and, and Paul have, have asked some of the, the stuff that I wanted to you know. In terms of the uh, allocation for COVID support, I mean, for example, how much of it is, has been earmarked for, for specific things at this point, you know, like rates relief, or for example, I mean, you talked about the, the need for economic recovery. So, I mean, has anything been earmarked for the Department for Economies? Uh, economic re re recovery plan and much is, is likely to be held in reserve. And then just finally, you know, you, you talked about uh, the MDNA outstanding money and confidence supply and the city deals. So, I mean, how much does that come to in total that still has to be allocated by the British government? Okay. Um Firstly, I'll just reiterate again, completely agree with the points around the, the NIO and the UK government stepping into the devolved space there. In, in terms of the COVID money, you'll be aware that our minister has uh, committed £150 million for further rates relief next year. Um, there's no other funding um, that I'm aware of has been committed so far for, for COVID support, but obviously the executive will be considering that as part of its final budget. And there is still um, some £127 million to be allocated as part of that final budget. And that is on top of the 238 million we're carrying forward and the 400 odd million we've, we've, we've already got. Um, so, in that case, I'm, I'm going to turn to Jeff for the actual NDNA numbers. It's quite substantial when you add it all up. But, Jeff, do you have the overall total of the funding we're waiting on confirmation of? So, that anticipated funding that we have, um, there's about approximately 164 million pounds of resource and approximately 90 million of. Uh, capital that we are waiting on now that those numbers may change slightly depending on just subsequent refinements but that's the the rough quantum thanks so that, that's 350 million in total uh and, and, and you know, i've raised this a couple of times over uh engagements with yourselves over the last number of months and other members have raised it and we keep getting you know answers like you know you have discussions ongoing and we expect it uh you know are we getting to the point where we're actually going to see that money being transferred I, th I think we, we will get the money with no reason to doubt that we won't. Um, I think the question is, will we get it in time to factor into our final budget? And um, as I said, the, the clock is ticking on that. We would we'd need a letter from the NIO within the next week if we are to get a, a final budget, including those figures laid before the end of, of March. But we have no reason to doubt that the funding will come and departments know that that funding will be given to them. So it, it shouldn't affect their planning at this stage. But it would be better to have that confirmed, and our preference would be to have it confirmed and included in the final budget. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, I'll bring in Pat then, who's in the building. Thank you. And Chair, I just want to go back to the point just uh, Joanne that the Chair raised because I really didn't understand it exactly. I'm looking at this funding, the, the funding of the 400 million. Uh, is, is this funding included? In the executive's 21-22 budget. Sorry, no, it's not. It, no, it would okay, be additional for that. Right, I've got that then. So, will the executive have to bid for this uh, in the 21-22 year? That's what we don't know. Um, we're, we're, the executive's not been asked to bid for it. NIO is deciding where this funding has been spent. How, how they go about deciding where that funding has been spent is a mystery to us at the minute. So okay, so we don't know uh, how it'll be spent. It'll be spent by the UK government on measures which it selects as related matters are reserved. Yeah, uh, and because of the powers taken under the Internal Markets Bill, the, the, you know they can also step into the devolved space there and some of their spending. But as I say we're we're unsighted um, as to how they're making the decisions and where it will be spent or on anything. As I say, other than what was announced at the budget, which was the money for Invest NI and for Skills in the Department for Economy. So, the the department advises on the size of the liabilities for the funding for the um, victims' pension scheme. Um, 
relating to survivors of the historical uh, institutional abuse as well. Can, the, can you advise, as is reported, it appears that the Department for Inf no, uh, Infrastructure, can the Department advise on the size of the liabilities for that? Funding for the Victims' Pension Scheme and the scheme relating to the survivors for the historical institutional abuse for 21-22? Um, there is funding uh, in the draft budget for historical institutional abuse in 21-22. Jeff may be able to find the, the actual figure for that. In terms of the, the victims' payments, um, you may be aware of the government actuaries report, report commissioned by the executive office, and it, it put a total cost in the scheme of anywhere between 600 million and 1.2 billion. Um, the, the figure for next year um, is still being refined. Um, my understanding is it's between about 19 and 22 million, but I don't have a, an actual figure. And obviously, we still are firmly of the belief that the uh, UK government should at least contribute to those costs. Jeff, do you maybe have the figure in the budget for the historical institutional abuse? So, in terms of HIA, there's about 30 million that will carry forward from the baseline and an additional 8 million that the executive provided in the draft budget. So, approximately 38 million pounds for HIA in the TEO budget. Um, well, so, right. And my last one, sir. Can the Department advise if, as reported, it appears that the Department for Infrastructure will be un unable to fund the capital elements for Northern Ireland water price control determinations? I'm afraid I, I don't have the detail of the, of, um, the, the DFI settlement and what can and cannot be funded in it. Um, if, if that's what the Department is advising, then that, that is their view. Um, departments are given a capital envelope, and it's for the department themselves to prioritise within the capital envelope they, they have been given. Um, one of the things that will be considered by the executive uh, as it's uh, part of its final budget deliberations will be um, the allocation of um, some additional borrowing that is available. And I think the, the Department for Infrastructure may have included a bid for funding for NI Water as part of that to, to borrow for that, but that will be the executive to decide as it reaches the, its agreement on its final budget. Okay. okay, Pat. Uh, can, Thanks, I, can I ask the broadcasting team to bring in Melissa McHugh, please, to the spotlight? Uh, Melissa. Sorry. Uh, I got chair and uh, fight role of uh, Jim Magus Chuan. Uh, you're both very welcome. Uh, just uh, one question this is in relation to uh, the, uh, the chances, but for he's announced that uh, he intends raising corporation tax from 19% to 25%. Will that have an impact here in the north? Or, uh, uh, and how much extra revenue is that likely to raise? Uh, uh, and how much of that revenue would be available to us here in the north? Um, I can certainly answer it, it will apply in the north. Without a doubt, it will apply to businesses here. Um, I don't have a figure for how much uh, additional revenue that will raise. Um, I will say that we won't get the additional revenue that comes from businesses in the north. It will go into the overall funding pot, which the Chancellor will uh, distribute it within the normal way, in which um, it will go to uh, English departments, and then we will get Barnet on that. So it, it, it will be part of the overall funding available. But we would have no sight on, certainly I wouldn't have any sight on what's raised here and, and what proportion of that comes here. Um, just, just to add to that, um, they, that 25% um, won't apply to businesses with less than £50,000 profit, and it only, it only applies in full to businesses over uh, £250,000 in profit, so a lot of our local businesses um, won't be impacted by a change in that corporation tax rate. Thank you. And just in addition to that, uh, is there any indication at all, maybe, uh, about whether or not uh, that um, the minister is considering using that weapon in his arsenal, i.e., that if they can take a decision in terms of the rate of cooperation tax that would apply to uh, businesses uh, located here in the north. But before, although that power exists, before we can actually implement it, um, we need to satisfy the UK government that uh, we have a sustainable budget. And I don't think we're we're at that stage yet, so I don't think it's something that could be done quickly. It may be something that wants to be considered. And if we had a fiscal commission, that would be one of the things that the fiscal commission could look at. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Gramaga. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Jim Alistair in the house. Yes, um, Ms. McBurney. This is the draft budget for 2021-22. Yes. Where within this budget? Will I find a single reference 
to the upcoming centenary of Northern Ireland. The centenary is uh, celebrations are being funded directly by the Northern Ireland office, so it wouldn't be included in our budget. There is no exclusion on the Northern Ireland ex executive adding to that and celebrating the centenary, is there? Not, not as far as I'm aware, no. So it is a deliberate choice on the part of the Minister of Finance and the executive to produce a budget without a single budget line in it, the celebration of centenary, or indeed a single reference to the centenary. Well, the, the, the budget is the executive's budget and the decisions that were taken are by the, are by the executive as a whole. Given the constrained uh, financial position this year and the fact that we couldn't provide additional funding to departments for many uh, pressures that they have, um, no, there, there is no funding included in there for the centenary. But as I said, the Northern Ireland office is directly funding oh, I celebrations of the, the I centenary. Under, I understand that. Are you asking us to believe that the reason there is no reference to the centenary or funding for the centenary is the restrained financial circumstances? Is that what you're asking us to believe? I'm, I'm stating a fact about the constrained financial circumstances. I also don't have the detail in front of me, but I'm not aware of a department having raised a bid for centenary celebrations. Isn't, and obviously, that, we consider that, the pressures that departments put forward isn't that the when, when agreeing allocations. And we weren't able to meet the vast majority of those allocations that are those pressures that departments identified. Ms. McBurney, isn't that the more telling observation that there was no bid raised uh, by the executive office or anyone else seeking money to celebrate the centenary? That's the truth. I would, I would caveat that I did say to the best of my knowledge, I would need to double check all the information. So it is to the best of my knowledge, and I don't have it in front of me. So with that caveat, I think there's also an awareness that the celebrations would be funded directly from the Northern Ireland office. Can you, it, it, can just, you... just to add to that, um, if I may, Chair, um, there is a, a fund, or there was a pot of funding um, for Northern Ireland unique circumstances, which was administered by the NIO and the, the NDNA board. Um, and I, I understand that um, some departments may have bid to that for centenary. I and mean, obviously then uh, the NIO are responsible for centenary um, uh, allocations. Mr McGuinness, I think you know perfectly well we are discussing the Northern Ireland Executive's budget. And one may, di may divert as much as one likes to try and suggest that there is NIO provision. The plain deplorable fact is there is not a penny within the Northern Ireland proposed budget to celebrate the centenary of Northern Ireland, right or wrong? I, I think um, Jeff's point there was the departments bid um, against that NIO funding through NDNA and therefore did not bid as part of the, of the budget. I think he was just wanting to clarify that it may not be the departments didn't want I, to bid for the right money, but they wrong, bid for a different route. Am I right or wrong, Mrs McBurney, that there's not a single penny proposed in the Northern Ireland executive's budget to celebrate the centenary, right or wrong? Yeah, yes, you are, are correct. Right. But as, as I okay. said, there, it's not Could that there you... will not be celebrations; they're just being funded through a different route. Yes. Can you think of a single country in the world which has had a centenary and its government hasn't spent a penny on celebrating that centenary? Can you? I honestly couldn't comment one way or the other because it's not something I've looked at. Well, would you be surprised if there was any country that chose not to celebrate its centenary? Well, I wouldn't think that would be a matter for me to comment on. No. Well, you've been making plenty of comments, so let me just put it to you that it is beyond outrageous and a political statement of the most deplorable type that here we have a budget for the executive of Northern Ireland in the year of our centenary, and the executive thinks so little of that centenary that it doesn't propose or ask for a single penny to spend on the, on the uh, funding and celebrating of that centenary. Not even a penny for 
money that community groups could apply for, that school groups could apply for. No, the centenary is to be ignored in this budget. Totally ignored. And you think that's a good thing? I didn't comment uh, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing. I simply commented that I wasn't aware of any bids having been received, and I'm not arguing. There is no funding line in the budget for that. I have just simply been stating a fact that the NIO has funding for the 17 new celebrations. I'm not commenting whether that's right or wrong. Well, I'm, I'm just saying that if departments don't bid, then we can't consider it. And uh, even if they had a bid, it would have to be weighed up against the other considerable pressures in departments. Well, I'm commenting on it. I think it is beyond outrageous. <laughs> that the Government of Northern Ireland is not spending one penny on the centenary of Northern Ireland, beyond outrageous, and a commentary on the unfitness of that Government to govern Northern Ireland. Okay, okay, Jim. Can I ask, Joanne, just before you go, uh, oh, sorry, oh, well, before I bring other members in again, uh, can I ask, Joanne, what officials, in, and this is going back to the 400 million that the NIO have to allocate, what officials in the NIO would be deemed as your counterparts with regards to uh, handling of finance? Um, I, I honestly couldn't answer. Um, uh, and I would have a very different setup than, than we would have, so I'm not sure that there is a direct uh, counterpart. There are obviously people looking at, at handling this funding, but. Uh, what their their role is, I couldn't comment on at this point. And even 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 through the three years when we didn't have a devolved executive and assembly, what role did the NIO play in administering the finances of Northern Ireland at that stage? They were obviously involved in any of the budgets or budget bills which we took through Westminster, but they would have done so on the advice of Department of Finance. Okay, uh, can I bring Philip back in again on? The spotlight, please. Philip, you want nor you want in again? If we can be, yeah, Chair, can I ask you to be quick? Just, just, I mean, I, mean I, I just want to make the comment that I mean, I'm I'm really not particularly happy about the nature and tone of Mr. Alistair's comment and our question and, and the tone and nature of it to officials, uh, Chair. And I, I do believe that you should have stepped in uh, earlier to to have made that point. You know, Jim Jim's entitled to make his political point uh, about the centenary, but he is well aware that officials uh, are here not to, to make political commentary on political decisions. And, and I, I just note that a number of, of uh, MLAs in this committee are already under uh, uh, investigation uh, because of their conduct of at these order. And I, I, I would like to disengage myself point from the nature there, of point the point of order. question. Point of order. I'll stop you there, because uh, whilst we'll not take point of orders in the committee, I'll, I'll allow you to Mr. come in. Chair. No member of this committee is entitled to make any reference to any subject that is under scrutiny by the Commissioner for Standards and Complaints. That is sub judice. You cannot do that. In fact, you should not even know or make reference to the fact that that has happened. And if you persist with this, then you will be referred to the Commissioner for Standards for a breach of protocol. Okay, a point well made, Philip. Have you a question, or uh, Jim? Have you a question, Philip? I, I, no, I, 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 I will give. I will give. You, you did mention me as chairing this. I will give members of this committee the the right to ask questions as they see fit uh, to officials, and everyone will get equal time under my uh, chairmanship. Uh, so I'll certainly. I'm happy enough to bring you in again, Philip, if you have a question to the officials. But, chair, my, my point was on the point of the question. Okay. Thank you. Well, can I ask Mr. McHugh, please, to be brought in the spotlight? Uh, Chair, can you hear me? Yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah, good minds people like uh, the problem is making, making exactly the same point that I was forced to make as well too, that whenever uh, Mr. Alistair was commenting on how outrageous it was, I thought that in fact his position in trying to force a representative this committee to make a political judgment was totally and absolutely outrageous, totally and absolutely uncalled for. And again, I would share the same opinion uh, as Philip in regards to the chair. I thought that you should have been more authoritative in that respect and should have dealt with it at the time. Yeah. You're, you're entitled to your opinion, Mr. McHugh, and again, I'll share this meeting as I see fit, and I'm going to give all of the members of this committee the time 
that they require to ask questions that they see fit to the officials. So thank you for your, your uh, uh, opinion. Uh, so without further ado, then, I think that's everyone that wants to come back in again. Uh, so Joanne and Jeff, thank you very much for your time here. Your, uh, your time here is, is very informative. We thank you for your time and the answers to our questions. So thank you very much and hope to see you uh, soon. Thank you now. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, bye. Can I, can bye. I, bye now. Bye. Can I instruct the Assembly broadcast then to remove the officials from the spotlight? Uh, and uh, again, can I ask, uh, is there any actions out of which the members wish to take forward from that session? Can I ask members to set out their views in respect of the 2021-22 draft budget? But before yeah. I do bring you in, can I uh, say that on table on table papers page eight, you will see uh, that has already been prepared by the clerk uh, an interim response. I don't know if members have had time to digest that and read that. Uh, so we'll cover that this all together with regards to any responses that we feel we need to make or commentary after that evidence session. Can I just add uh, my piece just before I bring other members in uh, on that interim response? I do think we should emphasise in the uh, with regards to the labour market interventions, I do think we should emphasise the the issue about the job start scheme not being brought forward, uh, as is the case in GB. Uh, this is something that was to be brought forward. The Minister had said, the Minister of Communities had said at that time that she wasn't going to run with the GB scheme because she was going to bring a better scheme into Northern Ireland, but at the minute with no scheme. And uh, I've spoken to some young people who have who have been affected by that, the lack of that scheme being rolled out. Uh, and you know that's dire straits for those young people and the businesses that were going to employ them. Uh, so I think we maybe need to be stronger in that regard and, and itemise that issue. Uh, and also I think we need to always caveat the issue around the programme for government uh, being aligned with our budgets. Now, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault that it's not aligned, but it should sooner rather than later become truly aligned uh, the programme for government and the budget so that the one populates the other and uh, runs with it. Because programme for government is meant to give the government direction and then you fund that with your budget and the two running separately just will not do cut it in my eyes with regards to good government. So those are two aspects that I would uh, like to raise with regards to in any interim uh, Response. I'm sure Jim will raise this in his contribution, but yes, I think Jim's quite right with regards to the, the lack of provision for celebrations and commemorations around the centenary of, of Northern Ireland, and I'm sure he'll add that now uh, when I bring him in. Uh, but I'll bring in Philip first. He's on my list. Philip, can you, you come in, please? Uh, Chair. I mean, I think it's maybe a different uh, le letter, uh, but I, I do think we should seek clarification on the point that you and a couple of us raised with regard to the, the, the British budget and the NIO uh, taking over the funding of devolved matters. I mean, at this stage, you know, it might be worth writing to the finance minister looking for greater detail in terms of the amount of money and if he has any knowledge of the you know where that money has been spent uh, before you know and registering or, or dissatisfaction or unease that uh, uh, devolved issue money is being spent by the NIO. Okay, Philip, just to be clear here, do you want that included in the interim response that has been tabled? And tabled no, I, I think it's probably a separate letter, Chair. Okay, seeking clarification in detail then around that. Chair, would yeah. that, yeah. that lead to the Permanent Secretary of the NIO and then copying it to the Minister because the officials have indicated the, 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 the executive doesn't know. So it's really NIO is what you want those answers from? No? Okay. Right. You have enough for that, Philip? Okay. Yeah. Can I, can, okay. Pat, Pat. Just for, on Philip's point, I mean, it would be interesting to know what you brought up as well, Chair, about where it sits with Scotland and Wales. The other default parts. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Pat, you're in next. Um, 
Sorry, did, did I hear right? I might have missed it where you, where you mentioned the, the kickstart scheme for young ones. Uh, well, I don't know. It probably uh, Northern Ireland's equivalent of. Do we have the equivalent of a kickstart scheme? The answer is no. Okay. Um, that's for the young ones, isn't it? From 16 to 24, those that find themselves unemployed and uh, on universal credits. Um, so Northern Ireland doesn't have that. Um, just, just for information, I had asked a question, I think, in the autumn time yeah. from the Minister asking if she was going to replicate the GB scheme, and she says no because she was going to bring in a, a better scheme. That hasn't materialised at all, and there's a lot of young people let down yeah. at the present time. So it was just to simply add that into the yeah. response. Would it be fair for the committee here? I mean, we can probably do it as individuals to ask the Minister of Economy to detail a list of job creation schemes including annual budget, annual spend, places, allocation and uptake, numbers in each of the last three years, taking in mind where we are with this pandemic as we have come out of it. I would ask the Minister of Economy the actual number of direct full-time new jobs resulting from job creation schemes. And what we are trying to build as we come out of this, would that be a fair question to ask from ourselves? I think, Chairperson, that might be better for members to ask those as questions, yeah. as assembly written okay. assistance. Yeah. yeah, but but if we, you know we incorporate that into our response here. Well, that's what I was hoping. Could yeah. we do that? Or will I send that out just that? Well, well, it can be an MLA question to your minister. There's no All problem right. that way. And then I'd rather MLA. Through the, but, this but committee if, if we, we if we put it, it, you know, if we if we include it in some way into the okay, draft okay. response here, with regards to that, then we'll see what comes what come out of it. Jim, you want to come in? I do. Uh, I want to dissent from the letter to the NIO. As I understand it, these are uh, national programmes, uh, the Prosperity Fund and others are national programmes. I don't understand why anyone representing constituents in Northern Ireland would object to more spending within Northern Ireland. So I don't, I don't wish to be part of that churlish objection. Uh, and secondly, I want to propose that the draft letter that's in the table papers which I find generally acceptable, that we should amend it to include an expression of regret that the draft budget makes no mention of or provision for the marking of the Northern Ireland centenary. And I'm no. couching that as neutrally as I can. I support that. <laughs> okay, well, we'll add then that aspect to the draft response. Clark, you happy enough with or do you want a form of wording? If, if that is agreed. Okay, members, would you be agreed that we insert that into the draft response, the interim response? Again, this, this isn't the complete no. picture here with regards to this, but uh, and of course we have a lot of work to do still on the draft budget. Uh, Philip, you were wanting to come in there, you indicated. Uh, just to uh, put on record that it's not something I would agree with. I mean, I, the officials uh, stated clearly that that there were projects and funding available for anybody who wanted to mark uh, the hundredth anniversary of partition. That's not something that you know that that, that needs to go on. As I've heard the minister answering questions on the chamber uh, floor, outlining that the same issue. So it, it's not something that I would support uh, contained in the letter. Okay, Jim, you want to come in? I think this is very sad because we had a decade of centenaries when the unionist population decided to do anything possible to allow those with a different point of view the right to celebrate things like the Easter uprising, the first meeting of the Doyle, etc. Whilst we were not greatly enthusiastic about those particular events, we understood that they were important to other members of our community. We stepped aside and we allowed people to seek funding and to have it in order to celebrate those events. We are now coming to the one event that is important to my community, the centenary of Northern Ireland. We are not asking members of the committee to come up with a figure. We are not asking members of the committee to condemn the department. We are just asking for one line to go into the report, the letter, saying that we are disappointed that there is no money earmarked for the celebration of the centenary of Northern Ireland. Now, surely there everyone in this committee, whilst you, you may not be dancing in the streets of Dunloy, a leak, or Castle Derg about the centenary of Northern Ireland, and I accept that. Surely you have to accept that there are people in your communities who will be, and they have to be respected. And if this place is ever going to move forward, we have to have room for each other's aspirations 
and each other issues which are important to each other. So, are you uh, as, as Mr. Uh, Dunloy, Mr. Dunloy, I forgot his name. Mr. McGuigan. Mr. McGuigan, sorry, Mr. McGuigan. As Mr. McGuigan, well, you are Mr. Dunloy, of course, as well. But as Mr. <laughs> McGuigan saying that he will not even give his agreement, or he won't even abstain on one line going into letter saying we are disappointed that there is no money budgeted for our community to celebrate an event that is important to us. Is that what he's saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, and it's not actually not accurate. Uh, and the officials have said that there is money available through other uh, departments and sources for fun. And I, I, so uh, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that anybody who wants to mark the centenary of partition isn't entitled to do it. And I'm not saying that they're not entitled to funding to, to carry that out. So, I mean, but the point I made is there is funding available, and I don't. Th I think it's unnecessary for this committee to actually mention that particular so, point at all. Well, could I at least ask you to abstain on this to allow those of us who feel this is important so, to express uh, a concern. I'll ask you to come through the chair, gentlemen, but can I just say this is, just to remind people where we're at, this is a response, a committee response, uh, to uh, an interim response to the 2021-22 budget. Uh, any concerns, any problems, any awareness that we want to raise on that, uh, on that budget. So, you know, I want to strive to try and get an exclusive a letter as I possibly can containing all of our concerns with regards to the budget. Uh, my way I come to this is that, well, look, if this helps with learning, understanding and education, especially our young folk with regards to the history of this place, then I think it should be welcomed. Uh, but at the same time, the fact that there's, it's, some people are concerned that there's no budget provision for it, uh, I think is a, you know, a valid concern which should then be included in the draft response from this committee. That's how I see it. Uh, but if there is going to be disagreement in this, I will ask for a vote on it. But if we can agree to include it into this as not being as having no provision, and we're concerned on that, if members are content to leave it at that, I will push on. But if members want to put it to a vote, I'm happy enough to do that also. Jim, you're wanting to come in on that? Yep. Well, I was just wanting to uh, counter what. Mr. McGuigan said, he said there is money. The point is, there is no money in the budget over which we have some say, the budget of the Northern Ireland Government or Executive, and deliberately so. And I simply want to express regret or disappointment, I don't mind which word is used, that this draft budget makes no mention of or provision for the marking of the Northern Ireland centenary. And I don't think really, as Jim Wells has so ably pointed out, that should be too much to ask of those who like to preach to the rest of us about respect. Okay, now I have mentioned things like the job start, I mentioned things like the programme for government alignment. Uh, other members, including myself, have raised about provision for centenary commemoration celebrations, educational facilities, all of that. Are members content to leave it that those things be included in this draft response? Sorry, Chair. Yep, come on ahead. Chair. Yep, sorry. Chair, uh, uh, Mr. Alistair has already stepped back from his uh, original position and there will be a celebration uh, of the creation of the state of Northern Ireland. And you know yourself, like everyone else uh, as well, too, it's just contentious in many respects. Some see it as something to celebrate and others see it as a destruction of, of democracy for the people that live in this island. But irrespective of that, the point is well made that allocations, monies, are there. Now, if you're to include that line at the end of uh, your uh, um, uh, letter, uh, then you know straight away that it's going to give rise to sort of contentious, uh, 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 re a contentious response to it. And that if you feel that uh, it should go to a vote, then I would suggest to you, yes, then send it around all the members and ask them to sort of endorse whether or not they're happy with that particular line in it and the way that um, you may choose to present it. Uh, or the way that Mr. Alistair might choose now to possibly revise it for the, uh, another time. Uh, but, and how it has been presented to this committee, one can only but expect the response that you're getting. Pierre uh, Pat, comment. Uh, Chair, I see no harm in the letter as proposed. So rather remain, I'm quite happy if it needs to go to a vote, but uh, I will be voting in favour that the letter goes as proposed. Okay, so we've got a very myriad of, of opinions here at the present time with regards to the draft uh, response uh, or proposal. Uh, are members content that we add something else? And of course, this will come back 
We can bring this back next week with regards to the meeting. Are members content about the job start piece and about the concerns around the job start piece? Yes. yes. Are all in favour and agreed? agreed? Are members yeah. agreed then about the alignment with the programme for government piece? Yeah. Are members agreed? Agreed. Okay, are members yeah. agreed that we put insert a line with regards to concerns about lack of provision for centenary? Great. Okay, so I'm going to ask a vote on that then. So can I, can I just ask there? Can I just ask there? Is this we're going to see a draft of this letter anyway? Before we go, we're going to see. So well, I'm sorry, can I come in? Well, there, there's no. Now that we're voting on it formally, I don't think there's a. I don't think we need to have it back. But but it's in table papers, Matthew. I know you're only in in page eight of right, table um, papers. So yeah. So, well, okay. Uh, so to move things on as quickly as possible, I'm going to. Put it to a vote with regards to insertion of a concern that there's a lack of provision for a centenary. Uh, can I ask for a show of hands, all those in favour? Aye. One, two, three, four. Four. Okay. All those against? One, two, three, against. So that's four in favour. Three against. And three against. Abstentions. Any abstentions? Okay. Leaving it at that. Mr. O'Toole. Sorry. So I haven't seen the, the, the letter, so you can kick me as an abstention for now. Yeah, well, you don't have to abstain, Matthew. You can, you know, remain silent if you no, wish. As long as you hear us. The, the concern that we have I is that you didn't hear us. Right, OK. That's fine. Motion has passed. OK, motion, the motion is passed then. So, Chair, because we're not meeting next week, I'll then have to send this. And because the, the budget will be going, there's a, to explain the executive, the executive will agree its budget before the end of the financial year. Uh, the committee just keen that the committee have its say at this stage of the budget yeah. now, so we'll send that letter as amended. Also, Chair, just on the question of writing to NIO, is it the case the committee is doing that, but Mr Allister will, will indicate in the minutes his opposition? Yep. Yeah. I'm happy with that. Nope. Happy enough. Okay, so that letter is going with the objection of Jim uh, Allister. I'm sorry, and just in terms of Mr Catney's reference to the various job schemes, do you want to write a separate letter to the Department about that? Personally? What is I would like to pull out from the committee, but I'll do it. I, I think if we have it in that response, the draft response, I think that's so yeah. as thing. well as well. Right. Okay. Dead on. Thanks, Chair. Thank o you. Okay. Okay, members. Moving on then. Um, we, that was a wee bit of a contentious issue, but then sure everything in politics is contentious, so we'll move on. Uh, item number eight then is the oral evidence. Sorry, Chair. Just a comment. Uh, I, I don't believe that last item was contentious at all. Uh, we live in a shared society, we have had the Good Friday Agreement, and I believe that I, I've been living where I come from in Moira, and in Lagan Valley I see no problem in what our Honourable Member has proposed. OK, thanks very much, Pat. Uh, item number eight, then, is oral evidence to the Department of Finance, feedback from public sector pension cons consultation. Can I welcome on to Starleaf, uh, Grace Nesbitt, Director of Pensions Provision, uh, Blanard uh, Smith, Assistant Director of Public Service Pensions, Stephen Ball, Public Service Pensions Policy and Legislation Branch. Uh, the evidence session will be reported by Hansard. Can I say that the following papers are relevant to this agenda item? Clerk's note at page 184, departmental paper at page 188, published departmental response to the consultation at page 212, and the departmental leaflet on the changes to public sector pensions pensions at page 260. So without further ado, can I ask then Grace, uh, you're very welcome first of all to the committee, thank you very much for your attendance. Can I ask Grace for you to make an opening statement if that's in order? Okay, thank you very much Chair and members. Um, I should declare an interest in that all my colleagues are members of a public service pension scheme, so it's probably appropriate that uh, that's registered. My opening remarks will be brief, as I provided the committee with a full overview at my last appearance to set the context. And in addition, on this matter, there was an evidence session on the 4th of November, and written updates were provided to members on the outcome of the consultation and the next steps. The key points from the latest briefing, which included further analysis of the consultation responses in the main proposal, can be divided into retrospective and prospective. On retrospective, the consultation addressed unlawful discrimination in public service pension schemes since 2015 
by providing affected members with a choice for legacy or reform scheme terms for service from April 2015 to March 2022. The choices are termed immediate choice or deferred choice underpin and are about when members make the decision about how this period of service should be treated. So, Prospective is about removing unlawful discrimination in the future in the reform schemes for all service from 2022. So first on retrospective, the overwhelming majority view was that immediate choice would present an unacceptable high level of risk for members making ill-informed or wrong decisions which were really based on estimates. Conversely, most respondents felt that the deferred choice underpin provided members with more real world certainty about their entitlements, as this would be based on factual information about earnings and personal circumstances, which will be available at their choosing point, which for most members would be retirement. And having considered all the responses, the department considers therefore that the deferred choice underpin represents the first option to ensure that members have the appropriate choice, clarity, and control concerning their remedy period entitlements, whilst also comprehensively removing age discrimination. Secondly, on perspective, a wide variety of views were expressed on the proposal to remove discrimination and maintain a quality of treatment for the future by ensuring all members will accrue benefits only in the reform schemes from April 2022. Some respondents agreed with the approach that the approach would ensure a quality of treatment, and others felt that those previously protected should nevertheless be allowed to remain in the, lem the legacy schemes indefinitely. This was often articulated alongside continued opposition to the original reforms which were introduced in 2015. Where responses argued for continued membership of the legacy schemes, the reasoning provided did not demonstrate how this would better resolve the unlawful discrimination rather than perpetuate through the continued use of an unlawful age-based difference in treatment. So having considered all the responses received on this issue, the department's view remains that the proposed approach to reaffirm the reform schemes for all future service ensures that all members are treated equally in respect of the scheme design available to them after the discrimination identified by the courts has been addressed. It would not resolve the unlawful discrimination if some members of the public sector schemes and not others continue to be in the legacy schemes after April 22, as this difference in, tre in treatment would still be attributed to unjustified age-based criteria. The department's policy approach resolves the age discrimination for Northern Ireland public service servants in the same way to that adopted by Treasury for members of the other public service schemes in Great Britain. To deviate from this approach or grant continued le legacy scheme membership for any sector within the devolved schemes would require bespoke funding provision from the block grant. This would also lead the schemes in question extremely vulnerable to further costly legal challenge and it would not resolve the discrimination issue. Finally, in terms of next steps, the department now proposes to implement the deferred choice underpin and reaffirm the reform schemes for future service in primary legislation. This will require changes to the Public Service Pensions Act Northern Ireland 2014. The department's view is that a legislative consent motion which will of course be subject to the approval of the executive and the assembly would represent the most efficient way to accomplish this. And I and my team will continue to meet with key stakeholders, including all the public sector trade unions. I'm happy now to take further questions from the committee. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Grace, thank you very much for your presentation and your time here today. Can I straight any questions then? And a number of other members will want to ask questions too. Uh, can I ask, has the department any leeway in respect of the changes to public sector pensions 
that it must make in order to maintain parity with the rest of the UK in respect of pensions. What flexibilities are there for individual schemes? Well, there are. I mean, pensions are uh, a devolved. Public sector pensions in Northern Ireland are are devolved matter, Chair. Um, but in general, the policy has been to maintain parity with the counterpart schemes in Great Britain, and that has served well over many decades. So there is flexibility in terms of secondary schemes at, at design. But on this particular issue, um, the general view has been that we would wish to keep in step with our counterparts throughout the United Kingdom. And there's a lot of common sense behind that. Um, and that's why on, on this particular issue, the view would be that we would go with, for example, um, a legislative consent motion in terms of changing the primary legislation. And indeed, when we look back, if I just could continue, Chair, when we look back even at, at pension reform when it was introduced, when we did have our own primary legislation here in terms of the substance in it, now my colleagues were just chatting earlier on today, when we look back at the substance of when we had our own primary legislation introduced pension reform, the substance of that, le that legislation was actually very much the same as the primary legislation that was introduced in Great Britain. So our schemes are very, very much the same. So the question we'd be asked is, why would we want to do something differently? Yep. C can you explain why, it, uh, why you're obliged to charge interest on the difference between contribution levels for employees who may choose a legacy scheme over a reform scheme? And again, is that to keep parity with the United Kingdom? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by charging interest, Chair. Uh, so. Uh, looking through your notes here, I think, I think the fire service raised this as an issue with regards to contribution levels between the different schemes. So you, if you're on one scheme and then you change or divert to the other scheme that may bring advantage to you, then is, is it the case that the department then is charging interest on that? It's just charging a higher level of contributions. I understand the confusion. Yep. Right, no interest right. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Chair. I think... Um, some some schemes, some pension arrangements have different levels of employee contributions. Yes. So if you opt for if your choice um, in terms of the uh, scheme that you choose, um, in terms of a legacy or reform scheme, has a different employee contributions, then of course you're going to have to pay the difference in employee contributions because that would that would be fair. Yeah. Um, but it's not charging interest per se. Okay. If, if that makes sense. And is that right across there in the UK? Well, if, if the pension scheme you opt for has a different level of employee contributions, then of course you're going to have to pay that level of employee contributions. But not all schemes have that. For example, in the civil service scheme, with the two main schemes, the career average scheme, just elaborate, Chair, would be Alpha. Uh, the reform career average scheme is known as Alpha whereas the final salary scheme is, is classic, the rates of employee contributions from 2015 are identical. So that's a non-issue for the civil service scheme. But for other schemes, there are different rates of employee contributions from the final salary scheme and the career average scheme. So um, there are differences between each public service pension scheme. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues, Blanard or Stephen, want to add anything else to elaborate on that. Yeah, in circ some circumstances, Chair, there would be uh, occasions where interest would be applied, but currently that would apply under different rates across different schemes. It was deemed more appropriate in this instance to levy um, a universal interest rate, and there's reasons for equality included in that also, in that members who did not uh, were not subject to discrimination may have paid a certain level of contribution, and it's deemed appropriate that interest should be applied so that there's no difference in, uh, in benefits as a, as a consequence of that. Um, interest will also be paid where contributions have been overpaid, and that will also be set in terms of a, a universal rate, uh, again, to ensure there's equality amongst members and they'll be treated differently. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Can I bring in Jim Wells, who's in the house here? Uh, first of all, Grace, uh, can, can I get the name of your internet connect connector, your, your provider, because your message has come over crystal clear, which is unusual on Starleaf, so it would be helpful to know why 
Why well, your presence? Um, I, I couldn't. I couldn't possibly comment because that would be seen as advertising. <laughs> do, do, do slip in it afterwards. It's, it's refreshing to see something so clear. A sad person that I was that I, I hung on your every word in your presentation before Christmas on this issue, and I have to declare a huge uh, uh, conflict of interest here. I'm the chair of the Assembly Pension Scheme. And I think everybody in this room, as a, as a member of the Assembly Pension Scheme, are an affiliate scheme. And it is a final salary pension scheme, or it was before the, um, uh, the, the changes. Now, um, you're saying here, first of all, are we in line with the other devolved administrations? Uh, uh, how Scotland and Wales, are they proposing a similar change to meet the conditions set out down by the cloud judgment? Identical. Right. Well, that heads off a lot of my questions immediately because. <laughs> so, in other words, we're, we're, you're saying to us we're more or less bound. If GB generally and, and England and Westminster and the two devolved administrations have all adopted this approach up until March 2022, then we, we've got difficulty stepping aside from that. Um. To answer your question, I was going to say truthfully, but about, I am always truthful. I certainly yeah. am to be. Um, we have we have the power. We have the power to do something different because pensions is a devolved matter. Um, but in practice, my strong advice would be not to do so, for uh, for lots of very good, sensible, um, practical reasons, and most of those would be for the for the benefit of of members and in terms of cost to the public purse. So my challenge would be in the question I ask myself is why why would we? And I can't come out I can't I cannot come up having worked in pensions from two thousand and eight, I cannot come up with a good answer as to why would we do something different well, on answer, this occasion. A good answer is that there are employees in very difficult situations such as police who signed a contract many years ago to go into a job that could have been quite dangerous at the time, had all the risks, families being moved overnight, people being attacked in the streets. And one of the reasons that they went into the old RUC scheme, which then became the PSNI scheme, was it was a final salary scheme based on their last three years' earnings. And they believed that having, and that was an important reason as to why they went into that profession. Yeah. They could have done something yeah. a lot easier. And they're saying to me, or some of them are saying to me, that. It's a breach of contract if they went into a, a, a difficult job and they assumed that a, a final salary scheme with retirement, for instance, at 60 in some cases, was an integral part of their contract. What right have we at Stormont if we have the power to break that contract? Um, and I have, I have huge sympathy for, um, indeed, for those working in police and other public service workers who provide a, a, a great service and I ad admire them for them. It's one of the reasons that I work in pensions. And as I often say to my staff, we do a great job and that we provide for public servants and we provide for, for their dependents. So I am very committed to public service and to public servants. So I caveat my responses with, with that. However, there is a cost to that. And the issue about whether Final salary schemes would continue for public servants, including police, was dealt with. And when I say dispensed with, um, please take that in, in the right context. And I don't mean that in a harsh way. And I say that with, with compassion for those working in police and indeed for other public servants. So please don't take that that I'm, that I'm being harsh or in, other, in any way lacking compassion for those working in police or for other public servants. I, I, do not mean that in that way at all, um, Mr. Wells. Um, I have huge sympathy. However, that, that argument was put forward and that argument has been dealt with when it was decided that public service pensions need it reformed. And they need it reformed for a good reason. They need it reformed to make them sustainable. And that's something that I regard as very precious because we want to keep pensions for public servants, for all our public servants, including police, and the particular issue that we're dealing with is transitional protection. So in that sense, it is a narrow issue that was found to be discriminatory. And these particular issues that we're dealing with are to remove the discrimination associated with the, the transitional protections. The Court of Appeal did not find that pension reform per se 
was discriminatory. It found the particular issue of transitional protection was discriminatory, and that is the issue which has been dealt with. The argument for, trans for pension reform still stands, and the argument for maintaining public service pensions, I would argue very strongly, still stands. So, you know, that is the best answer that, that I can give, and I'm very committed to maintaining public service pensions, and that is what we intend to do. And that really leads on to the second point that I made about the future and maintaining public service pensions and the, the perspective issue that we've dealt with as well in the consultation as well. So I, I trust that provides some clarity as to the thinking behind and, and the intention going forward as well. Unfortunately, it does. Uh, I find your arguments very persuasive, which, which grieves me, but I, I think you're, you're, you're right in what you're saying. But at the last hearing, there was a suggestion, you said that if we as an assembly decided, as we have the power, not to go down this legislative consent motion, but to have our own legislation, if we decided upon that, uh, we, you, you indicated that we would have to pick up the tab for that decision. It's unlikely that Westminster would fund any decision we made to, to maintain legacy pensions, uh, final salary pensions for public servants. You quoted a figure of £300 million, roughly, but you, you said you couldn't stand over it and understand that. Has there been any further refinement as to what it would cost the Northern Ireland Assembly if we decided that we wanted to retain final salary schemes for all of those who are in the schemes already up to retirement, even on an annual basis? Do we know what that would cost us? No, um, no, there hasn't. But the, the figure would be, you know, would be very, very significant. And again, that was an issue that was dealt with back when pension reform was introduced. Um, we know the cost of the of the, the remedy is around 100 million per year. Um, so that's, you know, it's a significant figure. All I will say is that public service pensions are, you know, are, are a huge cost and delay in implementing any changes is, is a huge amount of money and it's a huge cost. And there's a balance to be struck by how much we, we spend on providing sustainable pensions to public servants and how much we spend on providing public services. And it's important that we get that right because they're all provided for by the taxpayer. And it's vital that we get that balance struck right going forward and manage the, the limited resources that we have on, um, on public expenditure, you know, right, right across the United Kingdom. So, a final question, because I know I'm sure there's other members wish to come in. Uh, you, you took widespread consultation responses on the immediate stroke ref deferred choice. And I yes. think the overwhelming response was that members of pension schemes c could be able to make that decision at what the crucial stage is when they decide how to take their pension. Were there yes. any, was there any opposition to that idea and is there any complexities or problems that arise from that in the sense that that would mean the vast majority of people won't make that decision until they reach either 60 or 65 or in fact 66 uh, for some of them now. Um, are, is there any downside to that because it seems too good to be true that that option can be offered to everybody? Um, the, huge, the huge downside in my view are, is to pension administrators wearing my civil service administration hat because it means that in a sense we are going to have to run dual systems until everybody works their way through. Mm -hmm. And, and one example, when a, a, a life event, as we term it in pensions, occurs, so when, for example, somebody wishes to medically retire, we are going to have to do double the work. Um, but that's fine, you know, that's what the decision that will be. So we're going to have to give somebody their option as to what that particular period of service would look like. Um, did they wish to go, I'll, I'll just use the civil service terms for ease, um, what that period of service would look like should they take their benefits under Alpha, or what that um, particular option would look like should they take that period of service under Classic. So for administrators, it's going to have significant implications for them. That, in summary, would be the main, the main issue. Um, for the members, it gives them, the huge plus for members is it gives them certainty. Um, but it certainly has implications for scheme administrators right across the, the public service going forward. You said something I just want to check. You said that if we agree with everything what, of what you say, and you've been very persuasive, it's going to cost us 100 million just to do that. That's not to enhance anybody's pension. 
just, just to carry out what you recommended through the legislative consent motion, we're going to have to pick up the tab of 100 million for that. Well, the, the, the costs will be met by the scheme, and I'll just refer to Blanet, and she can give you more details on the, on the cost mechanism. Yes, Mr. Wells, that um, 100 million will be identified in the scheme valuations for um, the public sector schemes, um, and it will be identified as an employee cost. Um, so it will then form part of the calculations that works out what the employer and employee costs are of McLeod. Um, the McLeod costs are over a period of seven years, and they'll be reflected in the reworking of the 2016 valuations. Um, so it'll apply then over four years. Okay, thank you. Okay, Pat, come on ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, well, the unaffected employees have sub subsidised employees benefiting from the changes? Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, well, all affected employees have to subsidise employees benefiting from the changes. All employees will have the choice, so they will have the um, choice of whichever scheme benefits they want to take, um, and the better scheme benefits. Um, so yes, the uh, employee contribution rate will be set following the valuation then. And there is uh, no change in employer contributions. Okay, no change. They were set. No yeah, no they were set in 2019 um, for the period 2019 to 2023, uh, and there are no plans to actually change that rate. Okay. Uh, the outcome of the valuations and the impact on employees um, won't be known until the cost cap uh, has been reworked on the 2016 valuations, and we actually expect the results of those out imminently, uh, some indicative findings, um, because we are drafting directions for the completion uh, of the cost cap calculations in the 2016 valuations. And uh, we'll have results in shortly after that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not expected that there would be any increase in employee contributions. OK. Uh, so if there's no increase and there's no charge on employee employers, then I take it that on affected employees won't have to subsidise anything then or add to the burden or share? Um, no, they wouldn't be paying anything additional. Right, okay. I think uh, where um, some employees may see a, a perceived difference is that the initial valuations um, had indicated breaches to the cost cap floor. But they were the first valuations where the cost cap mechanism was applied, and the government had doubts that it was actually fit for purpose. And as a result, they have asked the government actuaries department to review the whole cost cap mechanism. So that's actually an ongoing review, um, which we expect to hear an outcome um, initially in draft form sometime in April. And uh, obviously, then changes would be consulted on by the government, but that would be a central Westminster government um, process. Okay, and, and I think I'm right in hearing that with regards to voluntary members' contributions, where members may pay extra at any given time to retire early, or if people then resolve to, to go out and have health retirement issues, I take it that. Those things won't really be resolved until the lifetime of the recipients in the schemes. There's a huge piece of work going on at the moment um, on all those complexities of the pension schemes. Um, uh, you know about the additional years. You know whether they can be uh, transferred and the cash equivalent transfer values um, and how they should be applied. And these will all be centrally agreed policies so that um, schemes across the UK can be treated equitably uh, in the outgoing of this. But there's a huge amount of policy development going on on the finer detail of the complexities of applying a remedy, whether it be under immediate choice or deferred choice underpin, but obviously the decision now is for deferred choice underpin. And it also involves working with HMRC. Um, because there are a lot of 
tax complications um, to applying remedy for the schemes and given choices and applying remedy retrospectively for the period to 2015 and also tax is uh, not a devolved matter such so um, the same tax rules will apply here across the UK. Okay, Blana, thanks very much. C can I ask them, uh, and I think I'm understanding this uh, a wee bit, <laughs> but <laughs> if, if employees, if there's no burden on the employees and there's no burden on the employer, wh where where do we get where do we get the extra awards paid for? Who pays for those extra awards, or is that through the lifetime of the scheme anticipated to be cost neutral? Where, where, where do we get the burden of cost? Um, well, it, it, it's worked out in the scheme valuation. An initial, before McLeod had to be taken into account, initial 2016 valuations did show significant floor breaches when this calculation was done on the cost cap mechanism. Now, the outworking of a floor breach would be that um, scheme advisory boards would have to advise the minister on changes to the scheme, which could be um, an increase in scheme benefits or a decrease in uh, contribution rates. Um, so what looked like uh, would have been a good outcome for members um, may not potentially be whenever the McLeod costs are taken into account. But the actual specific detail per scheme of what their final calculation is isn't available yet. But we do know what way it's looking whenever they have identified costs for McLeod and they're now taking it into account in the scheme valuations. Okay, so Employ employers did have an increase in uh, contribution rates from 2019 and have been paying that for the period 2019 and will up to 2023. Um, and that was set uh, in the understanding that you know th they would bear some of the cost of the breach as such. Um, so that they had an increase and that was applied because at that stage it was known that McLeod was on the horizon. Uh, and that um, costs would have to be absorbed for it. Okay. Uh, so there's still a lot of variables in the system, even at this stage, going forward. There is. Um, and at a scheme level, even though there are changes required in primary legislation, um, they're requiring like a pension schemes bill to make amendments to the uh, Public Service Pensions Act 2013 and GB and our own 2014 Act, and that would be um, <clears throat> to close the schemes down to future accrual after um, 2022, um, and to ensure that all members then were moved under the new schemes from April 2022. So that primary is required, but then at a scheme level, there will be regulation changes required, um, and two sets of changes because there will be some regulation changes required to make the prospect of changes, which is the people moving all into the 2022 scheme, and then a set of regulations for retrospective changes, and that would be to apply the deferred choice underpin remedy solution uh, for the period 2015 to 2022. So I suspect... And they would be consulted on locally here for our schemes. Okay, and I suspect, so there's a sequence of events then with regards to that, Starting with the LCM, then with a piece of primary legislation here in this adult devolved assembly, and then the regulations that will come out of that, the two sets that you've just said, just outlined, uh, one for forthcoming regulations and then retrospective regulations. Have we a time scale yet for any of that? Probably most importantly at the minute, the LCM. Uh, well, there's a broad timeline. Obviously, um, before we could go to the executive and, and seek their approval for an LCM, we would have to know about the content of the primary legislation that's proposed for Westminster. Um, so that's in early stages. Um, you know, they have drafting instructions, but we haven't actually seen a draft of the bill yet. So once we have further detail as to what will actually be carried, in that primary legislation, we would seek um, a view from the executive, you know, do a paper for the executive and seek their approval to seek a legislative consent motion in the assembly. Um, should we do this? There's quite tight 
time frames for this because this primary legislation um, needs to be through um, before the 1st of April 2022. Um, so if we were to seek a legislative consent motion and it wasn't approved, then our only other option would be to take primary legislation through uh, in the Assembly to do the same thing that has been done in the, the Westminster Bill anyway. So, um, the time frame for that would be very tight to get that done in this mandate and have it done for April 2022. Yeah, and of course, then of course you have the end of this mandate to uh, yeah. to contend with. So just so that I'm clear uh, and for the record, so with the LCM, uh, which is by all intents and purposes the way to go in this regard, but are you saying then there's also a primary piece of legislation that we need to have in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland Assembly uh, to complement no. that? No. no, we wouldn't need additional primary. Right, OK, so then we go straight into regulations, the two sets of regulations that you speak of. Yes, that's right. OK, thanks very much for that clarification, uh, uh, Blanet. Uh, Grace and Stephen, thank you very much. There are no other members wanting to come in on this. Uh, Jim has just sucked up all the questions there. The, the fund of knowledge I, that Jim I is on I just Grace's job. I think you've got one of the best jobs in the country, Grace. I want your job. <laughs> I, you know, do you know what I, I, I do love? I, I do love it. I do. Must admit, I, I do love Kent. <laughs> okay, listen. It was a pleasure <laughs> meeting you all again. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for being present here today with us in this committee. Uh, so thank you. Thanks for coming. All the best. Thank you very much. Okay, okay now. Thank you. Thank you now. Okay now. Can I ask the? Uh, can I instruct the assembly broadcasting team then to remove the? Yep. Okay, that's us. Uh, yep. It's not a conflict of interest to be on the same uh, pension trust here. It doesn't affect anything, so it does. I don't need to have stated that. I, I, well, no. I think we'll do a corporate. Right. We'll do yeah. A corporate declaration there for all members. Uh, okay. I think that was the. As members of the assembly pension scheme, yeah. Yeah. yeah and I'm on the same trust. That's all right. You're on the trust as well. Okay. okay, can I advise then that the committee is asked to note that it will receive related oral briefings on the associated LCM from uh, NIC, ICTU and NIPSA and the Assembly Research and has sought written briefings from the NI Teachers Council, the Police Federation, the Royal College of Nursing and BMA NI after Easter. Can I ask, uh, are there any other actions which members wish to take forward at this time or are they content? To leave it at that. Content? Okay. Can I ask then that uh, the Assembly Broadcasting uh, add all members to the spotlight for the rest of the meeting as we've finished all the oral briefings? Uh, agenda number nine then, uh, written briefing, the draft SR. Can I say that the Department has laid in draft the statutory rule, the energy performance of buildings? Certificates and Inspections Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2021. This is at page 266. Uh, this will reduce the statutory fees that are charged when data is registered for domestic and non-domestic energy performance certificates, display energy certificates and air conditioning inspection reports. Can I say that the committee considered ASL1 at the meeting on the 3rd of March and the department confirms there has been no policy changes since the SL1 stage. The statutory rule will come into effect on the 1st of April 2021 and is subject to draft affirmative procedures. The examiner of statutory rules has indicated that she will not be drawing the Assembly's attention to this draft statutory rule. So can I seek members' views? Mr Chairman, Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Chairman the last committee meeting had just come from a previous uh, encounter uh, with an estate agent where I was being required to pay uh, some of my hard-earned money for one of these certificates. I was somewhat exasperated, and I think that may have shown in my response to the, to the subordinate legislation. You were sore. I was. <laughs> it was because I was absolutely fed up with the amount of paperwork that I've had to go through for no possible uh, increase in the value of the property, and this was one of them. I think the officials may have been taken aback somewhat by my reaction, and I just want to put on record that it was not an attack on them whatsoever. It was just someone who had been gone through the mill with paperwork after paperwork and selling a house. Therefore, I have no objections whatsoever to this rule, and I have to, do not intend to shoot the messengers that had brought it in the past. Okay. Uh, can I seek other members' views? 
Jim was very energised uh, on energy certificates that day. So, uh, Any other comments? No. If not, then, uh, are members content that I say that the Committee for Finance has considered the SR, the Energy Performance of Building Certificates and Inspections Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2021, and recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly? Is this agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, can I say members uh, are reminded that this, that as the rule is subject to uh, draft affirmative procedure, there will be a related plenary debate, uh, and that's before Easter. Can I ask members if they are content to revise the agenda and consider an additional item, which is an SL1 extending COVID business rent forfeiture measures? Are members agreed at this stage? Agreed. Yep. So uh, then, uh, item, agenda item number ten then is the SL one on business tenancies, corona, uh, coronavirus restrictions for forfeiture relevant period Northern Ireland regulations 2021. Can I say that the department proposes to make the statutory rule? This is at page thirteen of your tabled pack. The proposed rule makes use of section eighty three of the. Coronavirus Act 2020 and provides that a right of re entry or forfeiture under the relevant business tenancy for non payment of rent may not be enforced by action or otherwise during the relevant period. The Committee agreed a previous rule which extended the period uh, from 31 December 2020 to 31 March 21. The new proposed rule will extend that period to 30 June 2021. Uh, this is as requested by the committee. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure of the Assembly. The Department has indicated it will be necessary to break the 21-day convention in respect of the rule to allow ongoing harmonisation with the policy position in Great Britain. Can I seek members' views? If there are no views, then I'll put it to the committee uh, that the Committee for Finance has considered the proposed statutory rule, the Business Tenancies Coronavirus Restrictions of Forfeiture Relevant Period, Northern Ireland Regulations 2021, and has no objection to the policy content and is content for the Department to make the rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you, members. Well, on to correspondence then. Uh, Some to go through here. Uh, can I say that members are asked to note the index of correspondence on page 274? Uh, just to relate to some of those, uh, Department of Finance Legislative Programme. Can I say that members are asked to note correspondence on page 277 regarding the Department's Legislative Programme? In addition to budget bills, the Department plans to bring forward the Financial Reporting, Departments and Public Bodies Bill, as well as a Fiscal Council Bill a social value in procurement bill and a public bodies reform bill in this current mandate. Uh, the committee stages are unlikely to commence in earnest just before summer recess. Thus, uh, committee scrutiny of any other matters is likely to be constrained from uh, September 2021 until the end of the mandate. We are certainly in the business end of this term, members. Uh, can I ask members if you are content to note that? If you, you are, can the, you say you're you agreed? Know what the public, Sorry, Jim. public bodies bills are doing with? Uh, yes, the Financial Reporting Department and Public Bodies Bill. Is that the one about the arms and bodies? No, that's the other one. The no. uh, Financial Reporting Department and Public Bodies Bill is described as a technical bill. That's all I have on it. Uh, the public bodies, sorry, public bodies reform Born bill, bill. Yeah. I think falls I think falls out of the arms length body review, which the executive did or is doing. Uh, okay. Uh, members agree then to note. Okay. Moving on then, 11.3, Department of uh, Finance, incorrect single farm payments, the historic liabilities. Can I say that members are asked to note a response on page 280 uh, to committee queries regarding incorrect single farm payments and historic liabilities? Can I say that the Department advises that DERA considers there to be no current liabilities relating to historic decisions on single farm payments and that any such liability will have to be met from the block, Northern Ireland block. Are members content to note? No, no, sorry. Jim, I, I raised this at the last meeting. They're saying that DERA has no liabilities, but that doesn't advocate yeah. our difficulties because that means they're saying it must come out of the block grant, so it still has an impact on the public sector funding in Northern Ireland. Now, um, there is a host of these have been called in for review. 
and single farm payments in a bad year is 240 million and a good year is 290 million based on the euro sterling exchange. So uh, th these are cases that went before a panel. The panel agreed with them and the department sought to overrule the panel's decision. That particularly occurred during the three years when there was no um, devolution or there was no effective control of the department. They must know that, for instance, if they ruled in favour of all of those farmers, what the total quantum of the claims were. They must know that. So they can't hide behind the fact that saying, well, we don't see ourselves as having any liability. It falls in the block grant, and we're not going to tell you what the liability is. That's an easy enough calculation, and they have the statistics. So I think we need to go back and pin them down on that. OK. In your, uh, in your experience, Jim, is it the case that if, if one is successful, they may all be successful? Yes, I think, I think there have been several court cases where farmers, well, UFU actually, took cases on behalf of farmers and said that the department had gone beyond its, uh, its uh, powers to overturn decisions taken by the panel. That you can't set up an independent team of people on a panel and then turn around and decide to ignore their recommendations. In the same way, for instance, I used to be a chair of social security panels. Uh, there was no, unless it was an obviously a totally erroneous decision, there was a, a presumption that if a panel made a decision, the department, then the Department of Communities, would pay up. But on this occasion, what, what the department decided was just to ignore the decisions made by the panels. And they've gone right back to a case that I'm dealing with in 2008. So therefore, there could be quite a bit of liability here, because I know farmers are getting 60, 70, 80,000 pounds in single farm payments. So um, if that's the case, there may be a substantial amount of money to be paid out eventually. All I was asking was, how much and who's paying for it? OK, so uh, members agree then that we write back just to ask for that estimated cost burden, no matter where it falls. Yeah. Are members content to ask that question again? Agreed? Yeah. OK, 11.4 uh, ABBA Driving School, the LRSS support scheme. Uh, can I say that members are asked to consider further correspondence on page 283? from Abba Driving School regarding the absence of the LRSS support to that sector. Uh, Abba, Abba sorry, agrees, or, sorry, argues that its premises are necessary for the delivery of its services and thus it should be included in the LRSS support. And I ask members are content to forward to the Department for further comment. Members agreed? Yes. Okay. 11.5, Department of Finance Draft Budget 21-22. Can I say that members are asked to note a response on page 292 to the committee regarding the draft budget allocation from, for the Department of Finance. The Department has included information regarding the capital and resource costs to establish and maintain the regional hubs. The Department is scheduled to brief on the reform of property management programme after Easter. Are members content to note? Agreed. Uh, Department, Department of Finance, the SR on the making and levying of different rates. Can I say members are asked to note a response on page 296 to the committee regarding the SR 2021-30 and the setting of district rates. The Department indicates that there was insufficient time to consult the committee and that it was suggested during a previous rates review. The Department advises that the new flexibility is now also available for future years. Are members content to note? OK, agreed. Uh, Committee for the Economy, engagement with the banking sector. Can I say that members were, are asked to consider the response on page 299 from the clerk to of the uh, Committee of, for the Economy regarding engagement with the banking sector? It is understood that the Economy Committee will make the relevant contacts available in the local banking sector. Can I ask our members content for the clerk to seek to make arrangements for this for an informal meeting with the banking sector representatives where possible? Pat and then Jim. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Committee for the Economy regarding the engagement with the banking sector. I, I was going to ask, is it possible for a joint sitting of the economy? I did ask it before, I was turned down, but I'm asking it again in light of well, some of the changes that we see across our high streets and banks closing. Uh, finance committee to take a briefing from UK Finance on the FSU. Okay, uh, Pat, I, I know you're very uh, uh, 
invested in this issue, and rightly so. Uh, but what I think we're proposing here is that the two clerks get together just to see what can be all released. Right. That's OK. Fine. Yeah, you were wanting to come in? Half of all the high street banks in Northern Ireland have closed in the last 10 years. If the present trend continues, apart from perhaps Belfast and one or two of the bigger towns, there will be no banks, high street banks left. And the, the, uh, Ulster Bank is the, uh, sorry, the Bank of Ireland is the latest. Uh, they've announced the closure, for instance, of Downpatrick and Banbridge. Oh, and we're now getting whole communities with no banking service whatsoever, like Refrenand. We had three banks in Refrenand. We had Ulster, we had Danska, and we had Bank of Ireland. They've all closed. As soon as one blinked, they all got mm. out of town, leaving a very wide swathe of South Down without a bank. I believe Pat's idea is, is relevant, and I think it's urgent. I think we really need, because I have no doubt that Bank of Ireland, having made their announcement, somebody else is going to be coming in very quickly to say, us as well, we are out of here. Uh, and that's just going to leave many, many parts of our community without a banking service. And we still have this problem about the implications for employees. Now, the Ulster Bank, they have a big back office operation in Belfast, which services uh, much, a much wider group of banks uh, and, and branches. And we, we really do need to see where we we're going with this, because it's going to lead to a detriment to our town centres, a loss of employment, and leaving many without an essential service. Okay, yeah. any other comments on that issue on the bank and the uh, engagement with the economy? Come on ahead, Matthew. Sorry, can I come in? Yes, sir. I'm just underlining what the two previous speakers have said. I think there's an obvious financial inclusion issue. Uh, we are seeing um, our banks uh, shut down at an alarming rate. Some of that will be inevitable because of the growth in digital banking, but not all of it is. And I think the key thing is that we understand what the you know what where the you know what the executive what the executive is doing, what the executive can do to stem that, because there are issues here which are distinct from uh, from what's happening in in uh, you know the UK level. Banking regulation is reserved policy, but the implication, the economic implications, and our banking sector are distinct here. So it is important that we, I think, take evidence. So I agree with the, the idea for a joint session, if at all possible. OK, members, happy enough to leave that with the clerk and the clerk of the Economy Committee to see what can be. Yeah. Jim, sorry, you want in? Yeah. For Melissa. Yeah. So Melissa, Melissa, come on ahead. Good chair, uh, commenting on the same issue as well too, and I think it's imperative that we do have that uh, meeting. Not that I expect that uh, we're going to get the type of response say, from the banking sector that we actually need. Uh, and uh, I think it was central to all of this issue in many respects. Uh, it's not just whether or not it's uh, commercially uh, viable, we'll say, in terms of the location of banks in any one town. Uh, and a town like Stuban at the present time is actually suffering as a result of the Bank of Ireland uh, closing their branch there. But that there is a social responsibility. And uh, I think that's a question that's to be answered at a much higher level again within government to put that type of pressure on banks and themselves. Because just like in the Republic and that, that you know, they come under pressure, they're very often looking to the same public uh, uh, to, to bail them out. Uh, and it is the taxpayer that uh, very often has to step up to the plate in situations like it. But that particular role has to be clarified or developed or discussed. And uh, I'm not that sure that even by having representatives of banks come into our committee, not unless they're at the level of where they're in a position to take decisions like that, that will find those types of answers. But notwithstanding all of that, I still welcome the opportunity not to uh, confront the appropriate board. Uh, banking and uh, how it is that they see the way they conduct their business and how it is uh, that they uh, treat our communities. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, no further comments on this? Can I come in just, uh, Chair, I'm, I'm, it's only just for reference to everyone. It's, it's just on the APG. Um, the Alistair Ross, Assistant Director of the Head of Public Policy, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. It's going to attend the Association of British Insurance ABI. Have them down to attend for the end of the week on releasing the Green Pension Fund. And John McCloy, Director of Communications, Business Banking for the BBRS on the work of the BBRS and the service update. Stephen Evans, the Chief Executive of Learning and Work Institute and COVID-19 Recovery. So these are the speakers that we have common to our APG, and I'd ask as many 
of our, our members here, probably to come as possible or get on, on, on to that call Throughout in the order to again. ask the question. Pardon? Throughout the day again, Pat? Uh, the date, I, I haven't the date here with me, but I, I, I have a date set for it. Mm-hmm. I think I haven't, I haven't it just on me now. I remember I put it in my diary, but I, I'll, I'll circle it round. No. I'll, I'll, I'll send it when I go home. OK, no worries. OK, we'll leave that with the clerk then to liaise with the clerk of the Economy Committee, if that's OK. Moving on then, members. Uh, 11.8, Department of Finance, Donica D Golf Club. And I say that members are asked to note the response on page 299 to the Committee for the Economy from the Department of Finance regarding financial support for the golf club. Are members content to note? Yes. Agreed. Uh, 11.9, Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, five-point plan for green recovery. Can I say that members are asked to note a copy of the letter on page 304 to the Finance Minister seeking budget cover in 2021-22 for the five-point plan for green recovery, including green jobs, etc. Okay. Are members content to note? I note well, the name of Daffy Mackay. He's come back to haunt us. Uh, I wondered where he went to. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's there somewhere, unless there's more than one Daffy Mackay. Oh, no, that's, that's it's, it's the same person. <laughs> yeah, it is. OK, members agreed? Agreed. OK, 11.10, Department of Finance, the damages return and investment bill. And I say members uh, are asked to note the department response on page 340 to the Justice Committee regarding the damages return on investment bill. The department advises that it can't estimate the liability as the costs of the new discount rate won't be known until the review is complete and the framework developed. Are members content to note? Agreed. Uh, Committee for Communities, special recognition payment. Members are asked to note a copy of the letter on page 342, sent to the Finance Minister regarding special recognition payments for those working within the community and voluntary sector. And I ask our members content to note. Agreed. Sir, I, I have to be honest with these individuals that I have in the responses. Um, we have many groups like teachers, firemen, policemen, those involved in the transport industry who have been at the forefront of direct contact with the public, as have the voluntary and community sector. My difficulty with this request is if we do agree and the Assembly supports it, then there will be a flood of other deserving groups, who, particularly the police and teachers, who will say that they were putting themselves right in the front line in very difficult circumstances. And if the Finance Minister was to agree to that, then there will to, be tens of thousands of others wanting the same treatment. And that's the problem I have with it. OK, Jim, your, no- your comments are noted. Uh, are members content to note the, the letter? Yeah. Agreed. Uh, 11.12, Committee for Infrastructure, Construction, Employers, Federation Briefing. Uh, members are asked to note a copy of the letter on page 344 sent to the Department, highlighting issues raised during a briefing with the Construction Employers Federation on one-year budgets and procurement concerns. Are members content to note? Agreed. Agreed. Department of Finance Investing Activity Report. Uh, members are asked to note a copy of the latest Investing Activity Report on page 346 in relation to the Department of Finance for February 2021. Are members content to note? Agreed. Uh, LPS Trust Statement, the Rate Levy Accruals Account 2019-20. Our members, uh, uh, members are asked to consider the Land and Property Services Trust Statement. Uh, for the annual report and accounts on page 349 for the year ending the 31st of March 2020. Uh, the report makes reference to a substantial reduction in rates revenue in 2021 and steps where which LPS is to take to address this. The Minister has also referred to the rates review. The report also references the Small Business Support Scheme, which DFE designed and LPS delivered indicating that control procedures within LPS as at 9th of December 2020 had identified 540 grant payments, totalling 5.4 million, uh, which had been claimed or paid in error. 118 of those payments have been recouped to date. There is also reference to a serious internal fraud and the PS9 investigation in respect of rates rebates. Additionally, there is reference to four risk-based audits which resulted in internal audit issuing one uh, priority one recommendation, 19 priority two recommendations, and 34 priority three recommendations, all of which have been accepted by the LPS management. Can I ask our members content to seek a briefing from LPS uh, and on wider issues relating to business rates collection and reform? Members agreed? 
Okay, thank you, members. Uh, the composite request then, uh, 11.15. Members are asked to consider the composite request at pages 391. Is the committee content with that request as an accurate and complete record for the committee's information requests? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, members, pushing on and nearly finished. Uh, 12 draft, uh, sorry, the forward work programme. The draft forward work programme is at pages 405. Our members uh, asked to note that the Institute for Government Briefing on Public Sector Reform will have to be postponed from the 24th of March until after Easter. Do members have any comments? If not, are members content then with the Ford Work Programme as amended? Okay. Agreed. Are there any other business items that members wish to raise? No other business then? Okay. Date and time and place for next meeting. Uh, next meeting will be on Wednesday the 24th of March. 24th of March at 2 p.m. in the Senate Chamber and on Starleaf. Okay, members are content. I'll adjourn the meeting. Okay. Okay, have a good evening, folks. Bye-bye. Programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Programme signed.